Hello. I'd like to welcome you to the third of this um, series of theory um, panel discussions, I guess we call them. Um, uh, this one is about uh, uh, the, the history and the future of AI. Um, these are a series of discussions which are um, going on every Sunday at the same time, <clears throat> 9 a.m. Eastern time, 3, 8, 3 p.m. In, in, in Europe, in Central Europe, and 10 p.m. in China. Um, and the idea really is to try and um, to open up the question about the theory of architectural intelligence or in AI in particular. Um, there are a series of these uh, we've had so far, um, the first initial discussion on what is AI, and then consciousness, uh, AI and consciousness last week. Um, and then next week we go on to move on to AI and creativity, AI and neuroscience, then into the architectural domain itself with one session about the architectural design, one about the use of AI in the office, and then the use of uh, performance-driven AI in the office, and so on. <clears throat> Today's session, I'm, I'm showing you again the work of uh, Rafik Anadol. Um, this is a style GAN study um, of, uh, uh, of the Gothic. Um, and Rafik, I should say, is also going to be involved um, in the kind of parallel sessions which are going on in the Digital Futures series. Uh, Rafik will be part of a panel on the 13th of February, um, <clears throat> looking at the question of AI and creativity. The following day, uh, uh, he said he would join us for a, se a session on AI and neuroscience um, on this part of this, this session itself. So these two are kind of um, interwoven. Um, if the digital futures things are uh, presentations are largely about the work that's been produced under, the, under this domain, um, then these are really largely about trying to develop a kind of um, an early theory of the digital. Um, uh, as, as I said, it, it's kind of, to my mind, it is one of the most promising areas for a theorist and I find it astonishing. So let's see how they develop. Um, I'd also say that um, the idea for the, behind these sessions, if this is the first one that you, you're watching, is that it's not necessarily about a lecture at all. It's more about a kind of provocation, shall we say, um, and, a, and a discussion. I'm delighted to have a number of very, um, interesting uh, 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 practitioners in the world of, 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 of AI here today. Matthias Del Campo is joining us, um, um, Philippe Morel, Manu He, Daniel Bolojan and so on. And yesterday, in fact, Daniel Bolojan gave an astonishing um, uh, workshop on uh, uh, cycle GANs and style GANs, which has recently been uploaded onto the same uh, website onto which this will be uploaded. So today I want to look at the, the, the question about the history. I'm I'm not a great, I'm not a great, well, I, 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 my background is in history and the work of Alberti, but um, I think that history is often, we push this history a lot in, the, in the, the architectural curriculum and we don't think enough about the future by comparison. Um, having said that, you know, I think that history, the future and the past are inextricably connected. I was, I've always been struck by a, a title of a lecture given once by Wolf Pricks, um, tomorrow, today will be yesterday. Um, tomorrow, today will be yesterday. Um, everything eventually will become part of history. Um, and so from my background, my background with Alberti, Alberti was really quite a, a progressive person at one stage in his life. He's now seen as an historical figure, but he was progressive once. Um, and so you know, we can't overlook history and history, particularly in the context of um, AI, where you're basing predictions on what has been given in the past on, on data. Um, shows us how important it is to be aware of what is already out there. <clears throat> so in today's session, I want to, the first part, I want to look at, look at the background of, of the origins of, of AI um, uh, uh, and, and then look at the future of AI. Uh, and in looking at the origins of AI, I want to pick out one particular question which, which struck me as I was going through my research. Um, and we're in early days of research. There's little out there at the moment. Um, we have a number of books coming 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 out fairly soon. Um, I'm pleased to hear that, uh, that Matthias Del Campo is working on two separate books um, uh, that are coming out shortly, and I, hopefully he'll say something about them today. Um, my own book, on which this is based, uh, we decided the title this week, um, uh, <clears throat> Architecture in the Age of Artificial Intelligence, um, an Introduction to AI for, for Architects. I wouldn't say it's necessarily so introduct introductory um, because, because it gets quite theoretical, but now's a chance to really test out some of those ideas, some of those observations that, that I, I came across. And I mean, it's not meant to be my work, it's someone else's work, but I wanna maybe float these out there to generate a discussion. And the theme that I want to pick up on to begin with 
is the notion that um, that AI is is somehow is is itself invisible. Um, uh, it's we, we're not aware of it, but it's out there. We're surrounded by it. Everything we do in our lives, AI is there, and yet we can't see it. Forget robots. Think about algorithms um, in order to understand what AI is. So this was a comment I made in the introduction to the book. Um, it is as though the Earth has been invaded by an invisible, superintelligent alien species, and the theme of visibility and invisibility seems to me to be fundamental to thinking about AI because, because, because it's so invisible, there are certain strategies that have been made to try and make it visible, primarily because it, uh, you need to market it in terms of um, um, investment and so on. And that leads to a, a, a certain problem because if you don't know if AI is there or not, you have to find some way of doing that. And this led to a series of, of high profile events in which AI has been promoted in the, on the marketplace, as it were. But this also leads to a problem in the sense that if you don't know if it's there or not, there is a risk that you could possibly be abusing AI and using it as a marketing exercise. So that's essentially what I'm do, I'm doing the first part of this um, session is just throw out a few ideas there that we can then have a discussion. Then uh, in the second part, I want to kind of throw out some ideas about what I've picked up on in terms of the, the, the way AI is going to be in the future um, and uh, how it's going to um, be perceived in the future. So, um, and this is not a thorough historical overview. It's just picking out some of the crucial points um, uh, about the history of AI. And the, the, there's much more to be said and to be read about, but let me just simply give you a cursory view of what I found out. What I found out. Um, and this is a slightly biased British view, I have to say, because many of the characters in, the, in today's session are British. Um, I'm sure that in the future, the characters are developing uh, AI will be Chinese, um, Indian, um, and out from elsewhere, um, and certainly obviously American. Um, but if you look back at the origins of computation, it's probably Charles Babbage, who was the, the kind of the polymath who was behind some of the early developments and explored the possibility of not fully realized, but at least conceptually um, grasped notions of, of, of two kind of engines, the analytic engine and the difference engine, which were the kind of early forms of mechanical um, proto-computers that were at least envisaged, if not actually necessarily um, constructed. And alongside Babbage, of course, there was Ada Lovelace, who um, for many years was overlooked, but was the first, now is recognized the first person to start to, to who conceptualize the notion of a programmer. Um, and we'll talk more about her work um, next week in, in the question about AI and creativity. Um, but she's now been recognized. Sadie Plant, of course, uh, um, celebrated um, in a kind of sustained, I saw one of these descriptions about her work as sustained cyber feminist rant, it was described, um, a magnificent um, rant. Sadie Plant uh, wrote about this, about the, the women who've been overlooked, but who are absolutely central um, to the history of computation. Um, and now, of course, uh, Jenny Sabin has just recently completed this installation that involves AI tracking, um, um, but it's called, being called Ada. Um, <clears throat> And for those who are, who are watching Doctor Who, um, Ada Lovelace has also appeared on a, on a session of Doctor Who. Um, but the person who is, I guess, recognized by most as being responsible for really launching computation um, was Alan Turing. Um, and again, uh, it, much of it was kind of foreseen um, uh, and, and uh, imagined rather than necessarily uh, saw, seen through. Um, but in 1936, he wrote um, an, artic uh, uh, an article um, in which he, he speculated about the possibility um, of what he called a Turing machine. It was published the following year. Um, and uh, that was really, in many ways, the first of the, um, <clears throat> the first um, kind of conceptual understanding of what computation might be. He didn't use necessarily the word computation as such. Um, Turing was at the time um, a fellow uh, was 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 at uh, King's College, Cambridge, um, the same university um, uh, <clears throat> as, as as Babbage himself. Um, and of course, during the Second World War, he was responsible for developing um, the bomb. That's this kind of this machine again, a kind of proto computer that was used to decode um, the Nazi Enigma um, uh, code, um, which had an incredible impact about uh, on on the Second World War. Uh, <clears throat> some people have estimated. Well, it's been estimated that, uh, that from 2 million up to about 20 million lives were saved because of this. And yet the, the irony of the whole thing was that nobody knew about it because um, 
it, it because it was under the Official Secrets Act, and it wasn't until 19, in the 1970s that information about this was launched. So on the one hand, uh, Turing himself was, was trying to decode, was trying to make visible the invisible. Um, at the same time, his own work was completely invisible. In fact, throughout his life, nobody knew quite the, what he had contributed. And he was also in 1950, after the war, <clears throat> um, responsible for uh, conceptualizing the notion of um, AI, of intelligence. Um, and although he didn't use the term AI because it hadn't been, um, hasn't been developed yet, uh, he nonetheless speculated about the possibility of, of there being machines that could learn um, and that were intelligent. Um, and famously, he devised the notion of what he called the Turing test, whereby you would test out how convincing AI would be by comparing it with a human and seeing if you could dupe somebody who was watching. Um, this was based on a British um, <clears throat> parlor game called the imitation game, where you would take on different roles and pretend that you were other, another person. The tragedy of, of um, Alan Turing, of course, is that he failed his own Turing test um, in an age when uh, homosexuality uh, was um, was outlawed. He was uh, he was discovered and convicted. You can see this is the court filings for what he was um, involved in. Um, <clears throat> he was convicted of of of, of uh, lewd acts, um, homosexuality, because homosexuality in those days was um, illegal. And he opted for a chemical castration instead, instead of, uh, um, of going to prison. But nonetheless, this was a, a very um, public, um, very public event. Um, uh, uh, he failed to, do, did not, not only was, it, was he discovered, but he was discovered and humiliated, as it were, um, on the national stage. Um, and as a result, possibly of that, certainly um, a couple of years later, 1954, Alan Turing died. It's suspected, it, most people say it was because of suicide, um, the humiliation of being exposed as it were. And of course, the irony of all this was that the, the man who had saved so many millions of lives, um, uh, that operation was, was, was that, that uh, contribution was not known because it, it wasn't until um, uh, uh, several years later in 1970s that is, that what he did during the war was made known. <clears throat> of course, we know about him now. Um, the imitation game was uh, came out a few years ago, um, and now he's a kind of celebrated figure within the, in the domain um, of popular culture itself. He's become a kind of poster boy for the, the for for um, uh, for the gay, gay gay culture, and also a hero within the the world of of, of AI and computation. And of course, his. Um, his uh, photograph, uh, his, his portrait appears on the 50 pound note. He literally is known by almost everyone. And yet during his life, he was unknown. So again, the theme of the visible and the invisible seems to kind of work its way throughout his life. Um, <clears throat> I was brought up in the UK, well, actually elsewhere as well, but uh, one of the kind of dominant figures that uh, was behind, uh, behind my upbringing was, was Doctor Who um, on television, of course. Um, and it always struck me that Doctor Who was an interesting character because unlike the American superheroes who would kind of slug it out in a fist fight, Superman and, and, and so on, um, Doctor Who would never get into a fight. Um, instead, he would use science and technology to solve the problems of the world every week. Um, and it struck me, of course, that maybe, maybe this is what Alan Turing had done. He'd used science and technology to solve the problems of the world. And I was speculating about whether or not um, uh, Dr. Alan Turing could have been the original model of Doctor Who, um, and actually, of course, it couldn't have been. He couldn't have been in some way sensitive because Doctor Who uh, came out, started in the 1960s, whereas the story about Alan Turing didn't come out till the 1970s. <clears throat> Nonetheless, with the time lord, you wonder whether you should worry about chronological time as such. But at the same time, in many ways, Doctor Who was the absolute opposite of Alan Turing in the sense that he was somebody who didn't actually do anything at all, but was a television celeb celebrity um, that was known by everyone and Alan Turing did something hugely significant, but was unknown by anyone during his life. Um, so this kind of theme is, was, is something that I want to kind of just pick out in the way that it's been traced through the history of AI. Uh, another sort of other event that came out that was kind of in, in terms of the kind of development of AI before the term had even been um, coined um, was the work of uh, Pitts and McCulloch, uh, the work on, uh, on a kind of early form of neural network. Um, uh, that was developed back in '43, based on the notion of the of the, the, the Turing machine itself. But the term uh, artificial intelligence itself uh, wasn't coined until 1956, when a group of um, 
of, of, of computer scientists, um, um, neuroscientists, and so on, um, established an event in Dartmouth College in the summer, a kind of workshop, um, where many of the kind of luminaries of um, the world of AI, the future world of AI, were gathered. Um, the term itself was coined by John McCarthy here. Um, you can see Marvin Minsky here, um, uh, and I think that's Claude Shannon here. Um, and it was when it was they they John McCarthy was is famous because he said, Well, I had to call it something. Um, so I called it artificial intelligence, but I was intelligence and, I, and I'd come across the term before, but I could never find out where I'd found I'd come across it. Um, in any case, I'm not very happy with it, but that's the term that, that, that stuck. So AI is the term that was there. These are the figures, many of whom went on to become um, luminaries within the field itself. And this is the statement about the proposal for this summer workshop in which the term uh, artificial intelligence is, is used uh, for the first time. Following that, there was a, it was incredible um, uh, uh, speculation about the possibility of what AI could lead to. It was hyped up incredibly, um, and uh, it was a lot of, lot of uh, expectations were um, uh, held about what AI could do. Um, and of course, inevitably, the, the, with, with the amount of, of, of hype that that's, um, was given to something like that, uh, such as AI, you're inevitably going to be disappointed. And uh, uh, the history of AI was kind of marred in some senses by um, what I refer to as AI winters, when um, confidence in AI collapsed, um, mainly because it had been overhyped. Um, and one of the kind of the, the central issues at the time, we're talking here about the, the Cold War, um, was the idea that you could use AI as a, to translate. And of course, now AI is incredibly good at translating, um, uh, as I'm sure many of you know, um, I use WeChat and the, the translation app is, getting better literally by the day, which of course is in the nature of, of deep learning itself. Um, but at the time they had lots of problems. These famously, and I recall some of these kind of these jokes being made about AI when I was a, when I was a schoolboy. Um, um, the kind of the translation of the term, um, the kind of the American expression out of sight, out of mind, it was translated into Russian and back into English again and came out as an invisible lunatic. Um, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Um, came out as the, the, the vodka is good, but the meat is rotten. So there, was, there were challenges, there were challenges. And, 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 and the, opt the optimism about AI had collapsed and much of the funding collapsed. So we went, they went through um, uh, what's known as, the, as, as, a, as a couple of, of AI winters. Also within that, there are other events that were going on. Um, in particular, there was uh, the work of Frank Rosenblatt um, was highly significant and he was developing a, a kind of, a, 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 a model of the mind based on, on neurons in the brain, the, the early kind of form of neural network, um, fairly primitive in some ways, but it was showing a lot of promise. This was part of the connectionist um, tradition within AI. And of course, there were many different camps, as I mentioned in the first session, um, different uh, tribes as they've been referred to, um, um, symbolism, connectionism, and so on. And uh, uh, the, part of the kind of the more kind of um, <clears throat> uh, uh, controversial aspects of what happened in AI was this book that came out with, um, produced by Marvin Minsky and Seymour Papert, in which they basically trashed connectionism. And after, as a result of that, um, connectionism fell out of favor um, and symbolism became the, the simplest approach, became the dominant approach. Um, and that also, to some extent, held up um, AI because now we're back into this kind of connectionist logic of neural networks. So what it took basically um, in this kind of world in which uh, things were kind of, um, uh, you couldn't see what was going on, the you know, AI is kind of, was kind of invisible. In order to promote it as a kind of a, a commercial opportunity, there had to be a series of high profile public events to promote AI. Um, and the first of which happened in 1997 um, <clears throat> when uh, DeepMind, IBM's computer, took on Gary Kasparov at chess. And many people had speculated about the possibility of a, AI being good at chess, including Alan Turing itself, himself, um, <clears throat> and, Marvin, and, and uh, also predictions being made by, by, about when it would eventually, um, <clears throat> when it was, this event would eventually happen. Ray Kurzweil predicted by, by the year 2000, and sure enough, in 1997, um, this happened. Um, <clears throat> This is in the second game, which was over in um, 19 minutes, I understand. Um, and uh, Gary Kasparov um, was, was essentially humiliated. Nobody anticipated that he would be uh, um, beaten, but he was. Um, uh, and, and some saw it as a kind of like a, 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 a triumph for AI, but 
Kasparov saw it as a triumph for humanity. After all, it was humanity who had actually basically devised AI itself. <clears throat> but he came to the conclusion that eventually um, AI machines would eventually be able to do better anything that, human could, anything that humans could do. Anything that you can do, AI can do better. Um, the second moment um, in this was, um, again, IBM clearly trying to promote its own um, uh, products. Um, they uh, held a, a, another challenge. This was the um, when IBM Watson took on Ken Jennings and Brad Rutter um, at the game of Jeopardy, the general knowledge question, which was significantly more um, uh, challenging. In both these cases, it could be said that the kind of the, the technology that they were on display was had actually been around for some time. It was nothing terribly new, but it was simply the kind of sheer scale of operations um, uh, in, in, that was deployed in, in this. Um, Anyway, as you can see, uh, IBM Watson um, uh, uh, um, won significantly. He uh, beat the two, two leading champions. Um, and uh, uh, Ken Jennings makes this comment at, one, at, the, at the end. He scribbles this on, the, on his uh, reply here. Um, I, for one, welcome our, our, um, our computer overlords, which is a kind of a tongue-in-cheek reference um, to The Simpsons. So the whole time there's this kind of popular culture like Doctor Who the Simpsons, which is playing out and then we're discovering about the possibilities of AI itself. Um, uh, and then famously in, in 2016, um, uh, Deep, uh, DeepMind, a company in London has since been acquired by Google, um, took on uh, Lee Sedol, one of the great uh, Go players in the world from, from South Korea at the game of Go. Um, and the game of Go is significantly more challenging than chess. There are more moves in the game of Go than there are atoms in the universe. It makes it extremely challenging. Everybody, of course, expected Lee Sedol to win. Um, and to their horror, he didn't win. And one of the particular moves in the match, which I've mentioned before, but is, is important because it's one of the most iconic moments, high profile moments in terms of the game, uh, in terms of AI, was this famous move 37 in game two when it seemed that the that the AlphaGo had made a mistake. There were certain glitches in the system and uh, uh, there was this move that, that came across and, and initially commentators uh, such as Fan Hui, um, some of them had thought it was a mistake and uh, uh, he comments about Lisa Dole that it seemed like a smile was coming over his face. Um, <clears throat> well, it wasn't long before that smile drained um, because it, this move had never been made before. And, and they began to realize the sheer strategic brilliance of this particular move, along with a series of other moves that were referred to as slack moves. Slack moves because there, it wasn't so obvious immediately um, how uh, strategically brilliant they were, but eventually it became clear. So anyway, as a result of all that, um, the, the world of Go was absolutely shocked. Um, a comment after game two, um, <clears throat> Lisa Dahl, yesterday I was surprised, <clears throat> but today I am speechless. And this, of course, sort of feeds into the whole question about whether AI could be created or not, um, a question that we will address in our next session. Um, but for sure, uh, it depends, of course, on how you define creativity. But for sure, not only did, did it prove itself to be creative in a sense, but it also showed humans up. And this goes back to some of the comments in the beginning of the, the, the first session um, about, um, about human intelligence. And it seems to me that what uh, AI is, is establishing is that human intelligence is only, um, and human creativity is only one part of a broader spectrum um, in terms of intelligent creativity. And it's clear that AI can, um, certainly in, in, in this limited domain of, of games of chess and Go, can clearly surpass um, human beings. <clears throat> and of course, this again was a high profile moment that was that appeared not only um, in, in television, but also there was a documentary that was made about AlphaGo um, that many of you have seen, I recommend it, it's an extremely good documentary. Um, but what is significant is that this um, was, was, everybody looks at this and thinks about this incredible game and this incredible move. But in fact, there was another match that was played um, against, uh, um, against the then um, world champion, uh, someone who was significantly better than Lisa Doll, that was not documented in the same way and therefore was invisible, as it were, to um, the world of, uh, 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 to the, uh, the public, the world outside. Equally, there was also another version <coughs> produced by um, another, another machine that was produced by, um, by DeepMind AlphaGo Zero, um, which was significantly better. 
um, than AlphaGo uh, and uh, had the capacity to to um, teach itself, had the capacity, was able to, and I mentioned this before also, was able to play 3.9 million games of, of Go against itself through reinforcement learning over a period of three days, the equivalent of 20 games a second. And this is astonishing in itself. Amazing, an incredible feat, but because AlphaGo was the one that had the high profile, we know nothing about AlphaGo Zero. I'm sure when you will confirm that this really was the most astonishing development. AlphaGo Zero was far more significant than AlphaGo itself. So the whole theme about invisibility and visibility, about marketing and so on, is central to the whole domain of AI, to, you know, in terms of hyping it, in terms of giving it, raising the public expectation about what it's about, whether it's in terms of getting funding from DAPO or um, other kind of agencies, or whether it's in terms of uh, promoting it in the kind of domain of the, of the stock market, market, it required these kind of high profile events to really bring AI to the, the attention of people around the world. And of course, the interesting thing about this is that, that it leads it to potential of being abused within the marketplace. Um, uh, <clears throat> another significant uh, aspect about this was um, uh, uh, the fact that this game was being played, um, uh, was being televised uh, to China. Um, in the West, Go is not such a popular game, but certainly it is certainly in China. It's the kind of national game. And when several million people watch this event um, and they saw uh, an AI, AI beating the best one of the best humans uh, um, at this get the game of go it really became um, a kind of a, it was a real shock to the whole system um, Kai Fu Lee who's an interesting character in his own way he's a uh, from Taiwan originally. Um, he went came to the states to go and do a PhD um, in, in computation and eventually um, became head of Google in China, the ill-fated Google initiative in, in China. Um, so he was in a position to be able to see from both sides. And he wrote this book called AI Superpowers, which really talks about the competition between um, Silicon Valley um, uh, and, and, uh, and basically China, and uh, Shenzhen in particular, where Yang Yu herself is based. And he makes this comment that not only does he predict that China will actually um, uh, uh, Will, will, will eventually prevail in terms of this, but he makes this comment that this was a kind of, for, for China was um, the Sputnik moment. If the launching of Sputnik into space, this Russian satellite um, that went into orbit was in a sense a wake up call for the States and led to the foundation of NASA. I mean, you have to see that the, 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 space, war, the, the space race was itself an extension of the Cold War, as part of the Cold War. And it was this moment when, when Sputnik went into space, that the Americans realized that they, this that they were being beaten by the Russians, um, um, and that led to what's referred to the Sputnik moment, the kind of holy shit moment. This is we are being beaten, and so in China, all of a sudden, people became aware of the necessity of AI and the importance of AI. Um, and not only that, of course, also um, in Korea, where this event was being held, held Korea also became aware of this. But one year later, President Xi made a kind of a speech about um, a bit like in the way um, <clears throat> Kennedy's um, uh, undertaking to, to go to the moon, a largely result of, 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 of the competition in the space race. President Xi gave this undertaking that China was going to become a world power at AI. And those of you who've been to China who know how astonishingly um, popular and successful AI is in China, China you can see precisely why this happened. Um, and I should say X-Cool was founded in 2016, the same year as the AlphaGo match, and just before President Xi um, had um, vowed to um, undertake, uh, to really push ahead with AI. And famously, as I mentioned before, of course, um, Putin has made this comment, whoever leads at AI rules the world. So there was intense competition that came out as a result of this. <clears throat> But the irony, of course, then, is, is if, if AI is invisible um, and you don't know if it's there or not, there is a risk that it will be used um, as a marketing tool. And I mentioned before, Sophia, the humanoid robot, um, that many working in the world of, of, of computation, um, of robotics, um, uh, in, 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 including Rodney Brooks, the um, Australian American roboticist, um, are highly dismissive of Sophia as being simply a kind of marketing ploy. And whenever you see her being um, promoted, it becomes very clear, you know, being shown, she has been promoted by Hanson Electronics as a form of, uh, of, of AI. And although she appears to be it, shall we say, appears to be an example of AI with consciousness, of uh, AGI, of artificial general intelligence, of course, Sophia is not, um, can, is, is unable to think. Um, 
and has been kind of, in some senses, passed off as what she is not. So what happens basically is if AI is not there, there is a real risk that it has been um, promoted as a, as, as a marketing tool. Um, and this I, could, I would call a form of um, inverse camouflage. Um, in other words, uh, if camouflage is about um, concealing what is there, um, of making what is visible, what is there invisible, then, in, then I would say that there's a form of uh, inverse camouflage in operation, whereby very often AI is being celebrated and promoted when it is not there. Um, this practice is architectural practice, AI space factory, for example, um, I met the CEO at a conference in Shanghai and I asked him, well, what, how are they using AI? And he said, well, we're, we're actually, we're not using, we have aspirations to use it, but we're not using it yet. Um, and in fact, uh, Theodorus Galanos has this theory that um, wherever you see AI um, in, uh, in, a, in the, the name of a practice, it's probably, um, it's probably the case that AI is not there at all. Um, so here we have this kind of the, the, the real the challenge where they, that, the, the question of the, about the visibility and the invisibility of AI um, is made most manifest. It becomes a, a marketing tool. Um, and in my book, I come up with this, this comment, uh, which is to say, um, based on the famous comment from, from Julius Caesar, um, the, the play by William Shakespeare, beware the, the Ides of March, beware the AI of marketing, Market, AI lends itself um, to being abused, shall we say, within the domain um, of, of the commercial domain of, of marketing. Um, so I just wanted to kind of to stop at this point here and throw it out there as a, um, uh, as a, as a kind of comment um, and to see whether anyone would want to go and pick up on, on this idea about um, the, the visibility and the visibility of AI, the marketing of AI. And also the way in which we have a certain history, which is maybe not necessarily the, the full history, um, because that's what's been given to us. Um, the fact that maybe AlphaGo Zero is way more advanced than AlphaGo um, as well. So I'd like to just, I mean, this is a kind of provocation to get things going, I want to, to open that up um, uh, uh, to discussion. Um, I particularly maybe um, would be interested in, in whether Theodorus wants to comment on this comment about AI and marketing and maybe whether when you would like to say something about uh, the AlphaGo um, zero moment. Uh, hi, Neil. When you, you hi. Yeah. Yeah, the AlphaGo zero moment uh, uh, was uh, very exciting to us and uh, uh, we somehow heard there's a new thing coming out because it, uh, it was not calling AlphaGo zero, it was calling master. It, it is a, a kind of a hidden ID on the uh, Go game. Uh, this is a kind of BBS that challenging everyone and uh, nobody knows what it is or who it is. And it suddenly become very powerful. And eventually, yeah, the deep mind said, oh, it's our new technology. And it's more powerful than AlphaGo Lee, which is the first generation has the, the competition uh, in 2016. And then 2017, yeah, the, the new one uh, came out, uh, yeah, had the fight with uh, uh, Ke Jie, the one of the China, most famous Chinese uh, Go game uh, uh, player. And uh, yeah, he has totally no chance at all <laughs> because this generation is so different from the, the last two generations. The first, the AlphaGo Li, uh, is said to to learn all those uh, uh, go game histories with all the possible strategies, etc. That's the knowledge from the uh, mankind. And the second generation is the kind of a uh, 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 prototype of AlphaGo Zero, which you just uh, need to know the rules, um, like uh, how to win, uh, what's the rules of a black and white, etc and it fight with each other. I mean, there's a, maybe two rows of it and it fight to each other. And uh, there's a, a rule to distinguish which one will win in each of the game. And uh, it's called the reinforcement learning eventually. And with this kind of new type of uh, deep learning neural networks, 
yeah, it's become more and more powerful because it 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 somehow uh, reach out or searched for some new possibilities, which are not even appeared in human histories, and we never saw that before, and. Uh, that is uh, so astonishing because when uh, I learned some of the ga uh, Go game when I was young, so I, I kind of understand how it goes, but uh, it's totally out of uh, our thoughts. Oh, we never thought about, okay, uh, how can you do this? Because this is not the regular routine. It's not a routine at all. And uh, you won't do that. I mean, one of those, uh, uh, the moves, you won't do that, but eventually it went. Sometimes it looks like a long sense, but eventually it maybe it's this much further steps than we thought. So at that moment we think, wow, it's really a new generation. It it can do something we call creation. Because the creation as we know before is we show something new, something we never see before. But is it really doesn't exist? Maybe just we don't know it yet. Some of the forms, for instance, the some of the OMA forms, let's say, uh, it's not new at all. Some maybe in the sculpture or some uh, Slavonic, uh, so historical thing. Anyway, there might be no new things. Just we don't know it, and the the machine can help us to find out it. I think AlphaGo Zero and the reinforcement learning is uh, something, yeah, in this way. And uh, uh, I want just want to make an example about, about this uh, is uh, in our practice. In X school, we, we're using a lot of uh, algorithms, not just CN, but also RNN, also reinforcement learning, et cetera. We find out there's a really different things came out from all those different models, not just the data you use different. Differently, you can get different results, but also the, the different uh, algorithms, it will guide to totally different thing. And uh, uh, I think reinforcement learning has a quite a huge potential because it's not just based on uh, existing data. Because existing data is very limited. For instance, uh, the CNN, we learn all those, uh, um, those modern houses. If you saw the one we did, we call uh, this building does not exist. Those ones we learned all a lot of the uh, um, well-designed modern uh, villas, let's say, those little houses. Uh, but we do something with reinforcement learning. We might don't need that. We just give the rules. What? How can we define a good, uh, uh, for instance, uh, modern villa? And then the machine can just do it over and over again. But there's one thing you should do is uh, you make the rule. Sometimes you have to judge which one's better. Yeah. So uh, then people might need to involve in and to make some of the, the judgments to help. So this kind of a data can be accumulated in a larger and larger uh, uh, quantity. Yeah. So so I, I think that that's that's something I, I want to share. Yeah. Yeah, just to maybe throw something in there. I mean, Costas Tacitus has this idea that everything already exists. Just simply we haven't necessarily come across it yet. I mean, that's a kind of right, right. A philosophical sort of viewpoint. Um, and uh, I mentioned last time he kind of like he he, he, he described this. In fact, when we met in, in Shanghai with, with, with Costas with a plate of biscuits or cookies, and he puts one behind his back and saying, you know, well, it's actually it's still there. It's just we haven't come across it yet. It's, it's, it's already there. So... Um, and one could argue that certainly in terms of kind of poetry, all the letters, all the words in the world already exist. It's simply a kind of question of the combination to which you, which you put put it to. Um, what, one question when you were well, there, just to say, well, I mean, 2016, um, I mean, uh, uh, you you set up um, uh, X Cool 2016. Um, how did this play out in terms of the kind of the high profile match itself and in terms of Xi, in terms of China? Um, uh, what what impact did it have on you personally and, and in motivating you to start up your own practice? Uh, actually, I was always uh, into this kind of a uh, new technology and how it combines with architecture. Um, back to Berach, like, like Peter Truma is uh, really into this kind of a new uh, associative design, this kind of thing. But we found there's a big... Uh, um, let's say a, a big uh, issue that it cannot uh, cross over 
there's a three things actually. First is the compu uh, computational power. We set up a, a, a traditional machine learning or associative model or a design algorithm or algorithm design. It has to run like a three days with your computer. That's a one of the big issue. And second thing is uh, uh, we don't have a new model of uh, the, the, the algorithms, let's say. We only have the traditional machine learnings and that is not so efficient. And the result is not so good. And uh, if you just do like grasshopper, you just uh, uh, do all the possibilities, there's a no recommendation system to mm. tell you which one's better. Mm. And thirdly, we don't have big data. So in like back to 2010, 2009, uh, we, were, we were trying to do a software uh, which we developed for a career uh, developer anyway. We found out these three things. We cannot cross over it, and uh, we has we had to give up our thoughts on developing a software uh, for this um, um, machine assistant design that doesn't work at that moment. And we're looking for something could resolve these three things. And gradually, between 2010 to 2016, we learn there's more new things came out like uh, compu uh, the cloud computation, computational on cloud, like computation power on cloud. Um, this is something can resolve the first issue. We can use the cloud server, yeah, this first thing. And second is the, there's new algorithm models came out. Like CNN came out uh, earlier in 2015. There's also already some papers. Uh, also back to 2012, like uh, Fei-Fei Li, uh, mm -hmm. She was in Stanford and she also launched something, an uh, image net, yeah, with neural networks. And uh, then 2016, we all know about the uh, uh, dem demise new work. And then also a big data issue become m like uh, more easy to understand after, I don't know, uh, 2014, after all those uh, uh, mobile, uh, these uh, smartphones, yeah, become more regular to everyone. There's a lot of data be created uh, every day. So those three things are the kind of uh, the, the driving force to make us to make this decision step further with our previous prototype to this next step. Yeah, I think that is something uh, we, we, we get from the history. Just because of every everything is so coincidence that everybody saw the power of it, but uh, in 2016, but doesn't mean it's just because of 2016. It's because of there's a long history. Also for the history of AI um, from 1956, right? And then uh, those uh, neural networks has been uh, brought out this idea in uh, 70s, I guess. Yeah, it's, it has been a long while and it just uh, like uh, doing circles and sometimes has upside and sometimes downside. Everyone's uh, looking for new solution. But uh, when there's uh, no computational power, when there's uh, no data, there's no new models, it just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. But the six, 2016 is just like uh, everything's okay, ready. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's yeah. Um, invite others. Uh, Matthias, do you want to say something? Uh, just a quick uh, comment because I, I really co I completely agree with Juan you and her view on how this thing started to develop specifically. I mean, uh, you, you showed like the historical development and the, the famous AI winters that we experienced because there was not much progress being done. But 2015, 2016 was really crucial. When you had pointed out CNN, I would also point out that Generative Adversarial Networks came out 2015. Ian Goodfellow actually published his paper 15. So we have experienced it within five to six years, an extremely uh, uh, fast development because of those couple of papers that came out at the time. But there is one problem which is very architecture specific in that whole environment. And when you actually touched on that too, which is the databases. Because the databases that we're currently working with are not designed for architecture. They are just general databases that we use. The labeling is not what we would do as architects occasionally. So I think what we need to do as a next step is really to band up and, and create databases that really cater to the architecture industry. 
I mean, I'm completely convinced that the whole work that's getting currently done in terms of AI and architecture is probably the very first design technique invented in the 21st century for architecture. Like all the other computational design methods that we know, we already designed in the 20th century. We, they just were refined in the, 20, in the 21st century, but this one is really something different. Hmm. Yeah, I want just to add up one thing on this because uh, uh, um, there's a very important uh, issue about the, the, how to labeling the useful data for architecture fields. Uh, we created this uh, X cool platform and we have over a uh, hundred thousand, uh, yeah, like a hundred thousand users online. They kind of uh, like enabling the usage of our platform and uh, simultaneously labeling the architectural uh, labels for us. For instance, our machine generate the uh, line uh, possible schemes and then this uh, architect select the three of it. And then this is a three possible label. Uh, and uh, uh, sorry, there's a three uh, positive label and uh, six negative labels. Just by their, this kind of move, they select, they download this three uh, out from our nine. And this is one, this is one way. And there's other ways, like they're all their moves on our SaaS platform it's all be, uh, let's say, uh, um, recorded in some way without no uh, uh, this uh, this uh, uh, privacy offense, but we record the uh, needed data. Yeah, and this data is a very, let's say, treasure because uh, before there's nothing uh, in this way. Yeah. Yeah, just to complement to some of uh, both. Uh, Juan Yui and uh, Matthias uh, uh, comments. I think we also have to um, include the, the aspect of uh, hardware, not only the software, because neural networks, yes, they are great uh, as algorithms, but they are nothing without the uh, hardware. And I think um, a young good fellow, he had a um, young good fellow who's a creator of, a creator of, of GANs, um, he had a interview with uh, Lex uh, Friedman, and he, he was talking about this idea of, you know, uh, he was su super lucky to uh, to create GANs at that period in time, yeah? Because if he, if he would have created GANs like a few years later, then probably that that, that GAN, in a way, the, the solution uh, or the, the outcome of the GANs would not be credible in a way, yeah? Because it will be compared with other kind of larger uh, uh, network that was that were created like two three years later. Yeah, and I think also the uh, the success of GANs also depends highly on on the um, computational power. Yeah, and uh, Nvidia doing a, an amazing job of uh, really developing uh, processing units. Yeah, for that. Just uh, also a quick comment because that. Uh, both Vanyu and Daniel, um, the, the, the argument for the, the powerful machines that can run like these large neural networks uh, is primarily because the neural networks we're working with are so hungry for data. But there is also current developments that are speculating about how to use data scarcity to create neural networks. And that would be super interesting because then we can really train networks not because we have millions and millions of images, but because it's more intelligently uh, uh, working through the data, yeah. Um, so it, I did this comparison already last time about you know a kid that can learn what is a dog just by seeing a couple of dogs, yeah, and it doesn't need to see millions of dogs to understand that's a dog, a and that has to do a lot with the environment it is in. So if you actually are able to create a neural network that has other networks teaching him that's a dog instead of just trying to learn it on its own, yeah we might be able to pull off things with less data than we're currently doing, meaning less powerful computers, easier to do, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I just, I just wanted to comment uh, on, on your initial point, Neil, of I really like this idea of invisibility, invisibility. And I, I, I just wanted to, I had a, a couple of thoughts. First, I, I, it's obvious that today AI is, is 
ever visible, right? It, it's it's apparently everywhere, right? And not apparently, I think it's it's very important to stress, but it is in fact not there most of the time. So uh, and not and this is not just in architecture, right? It's it's in a lot of other yeah a lot of other applications. First of all, most of them we shouldn't be calling them AI. Some of them are deep learning applications. Some are machine learning applications. I believe eighty percent of the applications are running random forests, right? It's not like AI, but it's something that let's say yeah has taken a name, an umbrella name, and it appears to be the at its most visible. I think, like you said, when it's not there, and I think I think that that is an interesting an interesting thing to consider. And the other interesting thing to consider is uh, does the opposite apply? Is it is it like you mentioned putin says whoever controls control the world uh, is that control so powerful because it's not visible when it's there like that's my other question like uh, a lot of these technologies that can be pervasive right they have you know data issues like uh, you know personal information they have ethical issues and all this stuff are not really visible to most of us even though there are people trying to do conversations about them lately and there is a lot of you know, discussion everywhere in social media, but they're not really visible. So I wonder if the, the aspect of real power of AI is there because it, it can be invisible when it works. And I think that there is a bit of impotence in the idea that uh, it's, it's apparently there, but it's not there. And I think that kind of hurts. Like when, when, when the, why I, 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 I have said this and why it matters to me for architecture or design in general is because I feel when we do that, when we say we are there, I have it in my logo or something, but it's not there, we are kind of keeping the field behind. So like when a young architect or a young designer sees, I don't know, a very big company, right? Like we're talking about maybe the one of the five biggest companies saying, look, we've done it, you know, we have this AI design. So they might think, okay, what do I do now? You know, like, what's the point? And, and I think it that that's the first aspect. Of course, the second aspect is I would never share how they did it mostly because they don't know how, but also if they knew, they wouldn't like it. So we have this issue of like, sort of like blocking people that would like to make a difference, I think, through this, through that point. And the last one I want to make about the, the list at all, and also Deep Blue, I think in both cases, it was also a move, right? If I remember correctly, I was, I, was, I don't know. In Deep Blue, I believe, there was also a very odd move. I think, I'm not sure if it was a sacrifice or something, something Deep Blue did that it wasn't correct. And I really want to touch that string, that, 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 uh, yeah, that string. And I think, because in both cases, there was this move, this other move, and we talked about creativity. And, you know, the idea is creativity is something new and does something new exist? I believe it does exist. And I disagree with that idea, of course, but it doesn't matter. Uh, but I think it, that it's interesting to consider that not only I think it's something new, like it wasn't that move that, that made a difference. It was that move in the context of the whole game and the history and the sequence of moves. So it's it's something much higher than just just a decision. And I think this is something to think of a metaphor or a parallel for design, right? It's not just creating some house that wasn't there. So the, there is a, this 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 popularity now lately. Everything is called that does not exist. So there is this anime that does not exist. This thing that does not this folk and this house that does not exist. And that's not the creativity necessarily by itself, but it's also like, what does it generate? You know, what, what sequences does it illuminate in a way? What does it illuminate in the design space in, in, in a sense by just viewing it? So, so that's my, my sort of how I see AI being creative in design, not just creating some design that we didn't see before, but somehow like illuminating, okay, what does this design mean? What are the steps to get there? And what are the other designs near it? And what what, what do the relationship between them show us in all, all this exploration and uh, design intelligence? So I think, yeah, those are the strands that I wanted to pick. Yeah, and continuing with that idea, continuing with that idea, it's also, I think, um, I mean, what we call today creative, yesterday we didn't call creative. So, and what we call today creative, tomorrow we are not going to call creative, yeah? And I think it's most of the time, it's also, you have to look at this, not necessarily like they are producing something creative. Maybe sometimes you're looking at, is the process maybe creative, yeah? Is that the way that you're chaining certain processes that leads to something creative, yeah? Is this kind of like rules, like in uh, AlphaGo, okay, those kind of rules that, you know, the way the sequence, how you play the, the, 
uh, the moves and so on is that the, the creative part yeah not the rule itself not the move itself perhaps yeah so i think we we have to maybe uh be careful with uh when we say something is creative really to understand that creativity can be quite a lot a lot of things could mean a lot of things yeah and could uh, could be applied at different levels yeah it's not just the uh, the precise output of something yeah When you did you want uh, to say yes uh i think there's a different levels of uh, like uh, architectural design or creativity and uh, when we say uh design something uh, sometimes we mean draw something like the the form sometimes mean uh the the organization but sometimes uh, it's just the meaning decision making so uh there's a different levels of it and uh, from our practice here, we are tr not trying to solve everything. Like the most uh, uh, artistic part is not something we are chasing for. We are more like uh, on the ground, trying to solving the most uh, uh, dirty jobs. Let's say you have to draw all the things to represent your idea and you have to change all those uh, data and or to calculate each room's the area and to fit all the forms and do all the regulation check, all those dirty works we think can be somehow assisted by the machine. And this is something very practical. And uh, a lot of our users, our clients, they are, yeah, they are really um, like it this way. The machine can assist them, not just, uh, yeah, not just uh, replacing some of their job. So I think we, we need to figure out what the AI can do to assist uh, the design, not the decision-making, of course not, but uh, assist them to analyze the thing, There's assist them to adjust it easily and assist them to uh, realize the project easily. Uh, for instance, our platform, they can output the final design drawings for the, for the uh, schematic design. Eventually, we will do the, the uh, detailed design uh, drawings uh, outputs. So for those uh, massive productions, as I mentioned last time to show our work, for those type of work, I think most of the, 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 the procedures can be done by the machine, but people still has a, a very important seat there. They have to make decision which direction to go. Yeah. Matthias? Yeah, I think that it touches on something which I, I really, really like about this whole AI in architecture conversation is that it allows for profoundly different positions to the problem. So it doesn't need to be like, we're not doing the same, which is good. Yeah, I like that. So Wanyu is focusing on a very specific area and she mentioned that, and I think it's absolutely necessary and important to focus also on that, let's say, um, tamed problem of the architectural production, but I, 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 for example, from my part, I'm really interested in the wicked problem of architectural production. Like, what does it mean in terms of material culture versus symbolic culture? What does it do in terms of aesthetics? How does how, how do humans come into that whole relationship to a to a machine that provides us with uh, pro, with, with um, imagery and solutions that we didn't think about, but that inspire us to do things in a different way, architecturally speaking. So there is like uh, an enormous plethora of possibilities to think like, how does it, how does it comply with material, materialist philosophy? Is it a realist philosophy and so on? So like, how does it tie into all these things where it's material producing those, those uh, visual results that we are seeing as humans and then getting inspired to do something in architecture that is different? Yeah, so uh, I, I, that's what I like about this. I can discuss this in the same realm of conversation like one you is, but we have still different positions on what we're working on. And that's for me also progress in terms of architecture. It's not like, you know, a style, like deconstructivist style. They all have to do the same thing, right? And look the same. One use for architecture looks profoundly different than mine, but it still has the same background, technically speaking. Maybe I can just uh, pick up on that. I think the idea of deconstruction is an interesting thing because it was effectively launched in architecture by, as a publishing venture by, by Academy Editions. Um, and it was packaged in a certain sort of way. And one of the things that I guess about the publishing world, which would be interesting to get the comments of Wanyu and, and, and Matthias on this, is, is that it's always looking for the new. 
it's always looking for the new. And in fact, you, 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 if something's already there, then you, you haven't got a space in the marketplace. But if you can present it and maybe overhype it as being new, that's when it's kind of becomes becomes a kind of marketing or a publishing opportunity. And, and one of the things I think is kind of interesting is, 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 is just the history of um, Matthias, because Matthias and I are now doing this AD that's going to come out next year. But these things have a long gestation period. And certainly when Matthias first, first floated the idea of, a, of an AD to Neil Spiller about AI, it was like it wasn't even on the horizon of possibilities. And all of a sudden, AI becomes a, the absolute kind of publishing opportunity because you know, it's become a kind of a thing that's, that's out there that is novel and therefore potentially marketable as a, as a, as a publishing option. So I find it kind of interesting that, that right now, I mean, certainly my publishers, Bloomsbury, are very positive about the kind of the selling books because AI is right out there, especially in China, right? I mean, obviously that's been a, bit, a huge case. Um, so it's kind of interesting to put it, just to put that alongside the publishing sort of world uh, as well. Do you want to say something, Matthias, about the your the, the about the your your experience of of uh, getting a publication? Yeah, that was really interesting because it, what you just said is absolutely true. I I started uh, sending proposals about an an AD on AI about two years ago, yeah, and it was like immediately like no, and like what what no? There's nothing there. I mean, what are you gonna try to publish? And then I I wrote like this. You saw it like a really long explanation what's currently happening like the development of neural networks and how star architects are use, starting to use them and like this whole cultural debate that comes around it and it's not just crazy Matthias sitting along doing that there's a bunch of people doing that yeah uh, and um, which by the way I just made up because I didn't know there were other people doing that yeah but mm -hmm. just to, to sound a little bit more credible just told them there's more people out there and then um, it took about a year to convince them and, and that's also when uh, I banded up with Neil because we uh, coincidentally, we started talking about the same things. And I was like, look, I sent a proposal to AD. I think Neil wanted to send a proposal to AD or something like that. And the idea came up just to do it together, just to, to join forces and get it done. And after, after a long back and forth and longs of deliberations, we finally got an okay to do it. It's gonna be out um, this fall. I'm not entirely, no, I think next year. 22 yeah yeah i mean part of the problem actually about publishing is the fact that you know as you do you, you're publishing something the gestation period is so long um we were just talking about this earlier on with jess and i i mean from from my publishing I, i've submitted the manuscript um well they're still tallying up things right now in fact tomorrow has to be the day when everything's delivered um but the point is it takes until until um uh until until october when it comes out and by then the whole world would have changed i mean i was struck by I was giving a course at uh, FIU on, on uh, AI this last semester. And during the course of the semester, the whole nature of the game completely changed. You know, self-driving cars, Tesla just produced their kind of their update, made it, they, they drove their cars self-driving. So by definition, the publishing world is always behind things. It's always way behind because it can't keep pace with these things. Uh, maybe to add to this too, um, uh, throughout the last two years, uh, I've been writing a series of, papers and some of them are already published and out there some are just to come out now in these months that helped a lot in in shaping and sharpening the argument and because every one of those papers is peer-reviewed so somebody's going to slap into your face if you're not right or if you're not describing it correctly and and sometimes you still have to struggle with people who don't understand the environment and just going to slap you anyways yeah um, so um, I recently had a really interesting, this happens like regularly, for example, when I start talking about dreaming, deep dreaming, dreaming, hallucinations in papers, I still regularly get slapped by people that say like, what are you talking about with this, you know, esoterical terms, blah, who don't understand where does this come from? Why are we talking about this? And I'm, I'm, I'm tired to explain it every single time. Yeah, so I just leave it out, which leads to another slapping. <laughs> but okay, that's just the nature of it. Uh, but uh, these whole papers helped a lot in shaping the upcoming books that I'm doing. So the, the one book is really more about theory and about the cultural implementation, like this whole thing about material culture and symbolic culture and how they both actually negotiate uh, aesthetics, uh, ontology and uh, epistemology of this whole frame of conversation, which I think is really an interesting problem. Um, and that's going to be one book, and the other book is uh, is going to be far more technical. 
and we are, I'm, I'm co-writing that together with uh, Alexa Carlson uh, from Michigan Robotics, um, just to explain the whole mathematics and everything behind what we're trying to do. I mean, one of the things I was also wanted to just to, to to comment on was that the discussion we had in the summer. In fact, uh, when you was part of a panel discussion with Daniel Bolajan too, um, with uh, Hovard Hochland and Maria Dance of uh, Space Maker AI um, about the. I guess what is interesting about the, the about now, of course, Space Maker has been sold to Autodesk um, for a quarter of a, a billion dollars. But um, what was interesting about the two two practices is that actually they depended on getting um, um, financial support and, and attracting investment. You know, without that, that would have been absolutely not possible at all. And it's kind of interesting. Um, the, one of the comments that that, uh, that came up in the conversation, Maria Dad said, she said, "Well, you know, the word AI does open doors." You, you use the word AI and it, and it opens kind of the doors to possible investment. But maybe I, I could just ask you, I need to kind of comment on the whole thing about the role of investment in terms of kind of trying to uh, launch this kind of um, enterprise such as XCool. Yeah, it's a, it's a very long story. And uh, be honest, at the beginning, it's very difficult because uh, in 2016, nobody understand what we, are, we were talking about. It totally has no idea. And AI is uh, already very new to them. And then with architecture, this is most uh, creative uh, job. It, they don't think it's possible. And then we explain, okay, AI is, uh, is not that kind of mysterious uh, alien. AI is kind of a technology can help us to improve something, help us to release some of the workload, et cetera. Okay, they slightly to understand, and also they understand the the more uh, more more feasible what is the work of uh, architecture. It's not just about the creating; it's just it's about how to represent your idea, how to realize this project in reality. There's a lot of things in between the idea and the real thing. So they think, oh yes, it's a really a lot of things to do and the AI can do help on it. And uh, I think the most important thing to get an investment is uh, um, you have to, to tell your story very clearly how this AI can help this industry to get to a new level. So uh, this is uh, something uh, from my experience, they have to understand. So there's a, a long way to educate the market, even for the CV markets, you have to make the, all those investors understand this is a really good um, way of uh, uh, investment to the future technologies, yeah. The question to, 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 that I have when you is, is, I mean, just tracking the kind of the story that, that Matthias has been telling, and you know, I've also experienced the sense that, that, that to begin with, no one was kind of a willing to kind of publish or, in your case, invest. Um, but then all of a sudden, it becomes a hot topic. It, it, it has in, just in terms of the last what four years, how um, to what extent has AI become now a marketing tool? I mean, a way to to attract investment, whereas before it was something that was very difficult to find investors for. Yes, today everyone understand what AI can do. It is a kind of a technology can help us to be faster and uh, uh, more efficient and uh, even the analyzing of the decision making is with a more uh, um, rational, let's say rational um, improvements, let's say. So uh, there's uh, some cases approved our methodology and our AI can really help on the real cases. And let me make an example. Uh, Vanka, maybe some of you know, is one of the Chinese largest uh, uh, real estate developer. They had a project with the, 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 uh, the land master planning or layouting with different type of uh, buildings or let's say different units they could sell. And uh, in their previous uh, scheme, there's uh, like, uh, let's say three, uh, 0.3 billion uh, overall value of uh, their scheme. This is something they already had. And they're not happy with it because uh, they think it can be higher. But because of the regulation 
constraints, all those are different uh, uh, code and also the, the FAR, GFA, et cetera, all those constraints, they cannot find out what is the best solution to get higher value. But with our platform, with Xco platform, it can easily find that there's a extra uh, possibilities. So there's not just the 0 0.3 billion, there's a 0 0.45 billion possibilities. And this scheme is something they never saw it before. And when we present this, I, this uh, scheme to them and uh, prove this is a uh, feasible with all the regulations, all the uh, parameter uh, requirements, etc., cetera, they find that, wow, it is really a good solution. This is something maybe in some limited time, in a short period, uh, the architects, traditional ones, they cannot achieve with. And the machine proved itself, it has the value to create more value, not just to be faster, to be make things easier. It can create new things. This thing is not a creativity, but uh, in a way it reveals something they never thought about before. Because it has a, there's a large, uh, very huge, powerful uh, computational power. So it can find out a lot of uh, uh, possible things and uh, it can recommend which one is better for this solution. Of course, there's a lot of things you need to do behind uh, all the data analyzing or the algorithms and also uh, people need to involve into each uh, steps uh, decision making. But eventually we get this results and this is just one of the cases. There's more cases to help them to get better ideas and to get more possibilities. They can make decision based on a broader view of uh, the, the possible schemes. So this is something uh, be proved. And then our investor buying this story. It's not just the bullshit AI can do something fancy. No, it can help the production, can help the developers to get much higher value. Yeah. Just to complement something to what the one you're saying. Um, I don't know if, uh, how many of you saw, th there was at one point an article uh, in Austrian press uh, about like uh, something like 30% of the startups uh, in Austria that were claiming that they are using AI, they were actually not using AI. And then, um, you know, then it's also this kind of discussion, like, uh, you know, you just use the AI for the sake of using AI. And I know that they had at one point a discussion with, uh, with a friend of mine, uh, I don't know how, how many of you heard of typing DNA, it's uh, typing biometrics for authentication. Um, and um, I was showing him a sort of idea and I was just uh, presenting to him a concern that I don't wanna come across as I'm just using AI for the sake of using AI. And he was saying, you know, as long as you're addressing uh, a problem and that problem can be solved only with AI, that no one will have a problem, no investor or no other person will have a problem. And I think also this is what Yang Wu is saying also, is like, it's not about necessarily that, yeah, I'm just using AI. If you prove in a way that there is a clear, clear application of that AI, why that uh, technology makes sense in applying it in architecture, then it's great, yeah. So I think here, just to connect, to connect uh, further with architecture from here, I think also for us, it's extremely important, like as architects, I understand that we have this kind of, um, uh, this kind of, uh, not myth, but this kind of way of operating as architect, we just play with technology because we just want to explore and whatever, yeah? But I think we, we have to also look at what exactly we are solving, what we exactly we are trying to solve, yeah? Uh, if Matthias is looking at design, uh, one year is looking at other things that are more pragmatic, another architect is looking at other domains in architecture that uh, are more uh, addressing other levels, I think that will help the, the overall profession more than just us fooling around with AI, you know, and then being proud that we are working with AI, yeah. So I think this is also that part of, you know, marketing. I understand that the world uh, works on PR, yeah, the entire world, the world uh, works on PR. You cannot live without PR. But uh, I think for if we want to have progress in architecture, I think we have to be a, a bit more mature and really uh, if we use AI, then uh, we should look at specific problems and then we don't apply AI just because we want to apply AI, but we apply it because that's the logical in a way, uh, um, logical in a way, we, uh, logical solution 
for that problem that we are trying to solve. Yeah. And I think if we if we have that kind of approach, that then for sure you know we will end up with uh, a lot of progress. Yeah. A lot of progress that actually you can set it in stone. Yeah. It's not just this kind of like you know just marketing PR something that sounds good. And then when you look behind, actually there was no AI involved. Yeah. Um, let's. I, I wonder if there are any other questions that uh, that anyone has because the second point I want to to bring in um, soon. Do you have any further questions from the group from people who haven't spoken yet? So I see that here somebody is asking, does the profession have that type of resource uh, for researchers? So I think right now in the world that we live in, I don't think we have that kind of excuse because uh, there there is access to uh, like a lot of open source access to network, of course, maybe they are not uh, the most advanced ones, but at least, you know, it's an entry level where you can start to get involved with, with, with this. And then you also have a lot of cloud, in a way, uh, options to, to train the models and to, to play with this kind of AIs, you know. Uh, so I, I don't think resources is a problem, yeah, in special in today's age, yeah. It's a comment just sort of what Sarah made in the in the in the uh, chat that uh, without military funding it wouldn't be at this stage. I think that's absolutely true. If you go back to this question, it was initially you know uh, Alan Turing was was working for the military, and then a lot of the work that was kind of done uh, in, in, from the 50s, 60s onwards was was funded by DAPO. It's absolutely um, crucial, and the whole thing was about fueled by trying to understand what the Russians were saying, kind of thing. Um, Maybe to, to, to that end, uh, one thing, um, I just posted a link in the chat. Uh, this is sort of a preview for you guys because it's going officially tomorrow online, uh, which is the page for the Architecture and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory at the University of Michigan, which I just founded together with a couple of other people. Um, so uh, the, the main idea behind it to make it official and make it something that is more rooted in an institution is of course to facilitate um, funding opportunities for that. Once you have a laboratory, you can actually you know, write that in a, in, a, in a funding proposal, send it out. And the main goal of this is, is to create a, a couple of postdoc and doc positions that are focusing on the research of architecture and artificial intelligence uh, in collaboration with Michigan Robotics and Computer Science. So it's really an interdisciplinary laboratory. The idea also being that it's not just architecture uh, PhDs in there, but also PhDs for computer science and robotics. So they can, you know, um, exchange ideas and techniques and so on. So this is really a, a, a test now. It is supported by uh, the Dean of Taubman College, Jonathan Macy. So he said that's that's a great thing to do. And uh, that's, that's the, 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 the issue with research is that you have to get the research funds to do serious research. Because without the funds, you can do, you can tinker around with software. You can tinker around a little bit with like hobbyist level of coding. But if you really want to go into the depth of it, you need to institutionalize it. And I just would say that to that, that I think that in a sense, the crucial domain that we're talking about is education because um, we are, you know, all of us involved here with with teaching and and you know i think the point is that that, that, that we we're, we're trying to to prepare a, a generation of students um, for a world in which ai is going to have a huge impact not so far into the future and i think that's a an important point i mean certainly in terms of fiu i know that by the end of the decade they're going to be teaching ai in every single discipline you know it's not as though it's kind of like something out there and, and my point is that we, we we actually have an obligation to try and alert shall we say um the students of today uh to this this whole sort of world because it is going to kind of it's going to be part of their their the, our students today are going to be at the peak of their career when precisely the kind of the singularity and all these things that have been predicted are about they're going to hit they're going to be going to be there so you know we absolutely have a obligation about that um i, I wanted to move on to a second to, to go and talk about the the future of ai do we have any further comments on on this before we move on Okay, let me just kind of make a, a, a throw in some something else to um, uh, um, to his way of kind of provoking the discussion further. Um, so, I mean, <clears throat> the future of AI, uh, which of course is something one can only speculate about, but nonetheless, in a way, many ways, I think it's really important to be able to kind of get that out on the horizon to to make it a part of the agenda. Um, um, 
Prediction is very difficult, especially about the future. One of the things I've discovered, I don't know if you guys have discovered this or not, but but the problem about prediction or, or about bringing something out new is that if you're if it's wrong, it's it's obvious it's wrong. And if it's right, it soon gets kind of uh, absorbed. I, I had this experience back in Cambridge where um, uh, I, I lived next door to a guy called uh, Clive Sinclair, um, who was responsible for, for introducing well, spending a lot of money on, on launching a thing called the C5, which is some kind of electric sort of tricycle that you'd you'd lie down on. And it was a huge flop. He was a guy who actually had invented the pocket calculator, but hadn't invested in it properly and made a mistake there. But he made a second mistake investing in something that uh, wasn't going to work. And it was a huge, um, a huge embarrassment to him. Meanwhile, I, I back in 1990, what was it, one, two, or something like that? I two, I think it was. I I redesigned my own my my. I bought a house and redesigned it, and I put in a, a stainless steel kitchen. Now, what was kind of weird was was those days the only people putting in stainless steel kitchens were a few architects and Her Majesty's prisons. They used stainless steel for for um to, for, for prisons. And and in fact, I had to go to a company called Andersons who were making fabricating stainless steel for prisons to get my work, my counter um, fabricated. Um, and of course, for a while, uh, this was for about six months, this was new. And then all of a sudden, stainless steel kitchens uh, became kind of popular. And 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 some of you said to me, oh, a few years later, oh, you've got one of those kitchens. And I wanted to say, well, I was, the, I was one of the first people to do it. But the point is that once you do something that's obvious, it becomes, it, it, the, 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 it's right, it becomes obvious. If you do something that's wrong, it's equally obvious that, that, that it's wrong. But anyway, um, just to kind of comment on this, I mean, Ray Kurzweil um, is possibly the person who is most famous for making predictions about the future. Um, Kurzweil's view is basically is, is that the reason why we have a brain is in order to make predictions. I mean, he uses the example of a, a kind of primitive cave person who is kind of walking out and, and, a, and is heading in one direction. Then they see a kind of dinosaur or something coming across the horizon and realize that that's going to intercept its pathway and therefore decide to go and um, take a different sort of route. So the prediction is, is, is fundamental to survival in, in many ways. And of course, so humans are based on that. And of course, typically um, computers too. Prediction is, is, is part, a central part of AI. And one of the comments we'll come to when we deal with, with neuroscience is that the idea of prediction itself is inherent, so perception itself is inherently predictive. This is a comment that's coming out in neuroscience. People like Anil Seth are talking about this kind of question. So the idea of prediction is kind of it's kind of central. And, and Ray Kurzweil has been the kind of the, the now he's he's um I mean going to just pick up on the, the comment we were talking about before about visibility. He's now working for Google. This is actually a building that's about a hundred hundred meters away from where I I am right now. It's the um, the Google headquarters in um, in uh, in Venice, California, um, designed by Frank Gehry with these binoculars, which is kind of interesting in itself because uh, it's about searching, of course, Google. But then the other aspect of Google is, to my mind, I don't know, I'm sure someone's commented on this. It's actually, it's not so much about you searching for a product as, as actually you becoming a product that they're searching for with the, in the sense of the, they can pick up on, on your, your searches and so on. And it's precisely the advertising that itself is kind of funding Google. So we might think it's about searching, but it's ultimately about, about um, advertising itself. But anyway, Ray Kurzweil is now part of the Google initiative, but um, he's, he's over the years has been, has been making a series of astonishing predictions, uh, initially according to Moore's law, um, but more recently according to his law of diminishing returns, whereby um, he, and he has a series of publications. Um, and over the years, um, I, I guess what's interesting about Ray Kurzweil is that he's, he's made from the age of intelligent machines, um, he's um, made a series of kind of insightful sort of um, uh, uh, predictions, all of which have come true, um, and 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 all of which in some ways seem a kind of a rather, rather lame now because they've been so obviously true. Um, but 86%, according to his estimate, 86% of his predictions have been correct. Sometimes he's been a bit um, optimistic in terms of the implementation in, within the marketplace, but these some of the ideas have been. Um, uh, have been actually uh, have, have, um, uh, have eventually been been marketed, but anyway. Um, so along the uh, uh, over over the time, um, this is I think it was an interesting one back in 1992. Um, and it, the the point is that going back to my stainless steel kitchen thing, in a way, many ways, uh, it's kind of what he says is absolutely obvious now. You know, this idea that somehow you would have be able to. Um, 
log on into the internet and be able to get access to all the information all over the world and um, with a with a kind of something coming out of their school bags, out of their satchels, a kind of laptop and things. You know, of course, of course, people say, but actually in 1992, this was absolutely not obvious. And, and, and it's actually, the, it's a genius of, of, of Kurzweil that he's able to, to make these kind of comments. Um, and there's, there's a series of other ones. I mean, some of these are kind of, in a way, too obvious now. Um, uh, but again, it was the fact that cables are disappearing. I mean, we now, of course, it's true. Um, but anyway, so Kurzweil has done this a series of different things, which have been very interesting in themselves. And, and, and he's proved to be extremely prescient in, in, in being able to sort of uh, grasp what the issues are and largely correct. By comparison, there was this guy, this, this is, well, this Toby Walsh is also, he's interesting in himself. Um, I disagree with the title in the sense I don't think machines can think. Um, but nonetheless, he comes up with a series of predictions, which actually are kind of like, um, I mean, they're, they're uh, they, they're obvious in some ways. Some of these things are kind of like, it's it's almost absurd. I mean, you talk to your rooms. Well, you know, we already talked to Alexa and, and uh, we already, I mean, but as Rai's already been, done an installation back in 2013, where you could use, you, you could, you could uh, we use Kinect to detect a voice and a wall could respond to that and so on. So many of these things are, are um, blindingly obvious. And he's predicting this for 2050, but, but these things are, um, themselves already here in some ways. Um, the, the, the idea number 10, we live on after our death um, is interesting in itself because um, uh, uh, just this last week, there was this kind of, someone was proposing that we could have a kind of avatar which can kind of be um, based on our data and continue being who we are. And of course, we were talking about Zaha Hadid and how her practice carries on and one could potentially generate um, uh, generate sort of uh, Zaha building designs after after her death. But it was the first one that, that um, uh, we will be banned, you will be banned from driving in a sense, which is I thought were the most interesting comment that was made in some way. And the logic um, behind um, the Toby Walsh's uh, prediction about the about driving, and it's, it's something also that, that Elon Musk has, has, has mentioned as well, um, the idea that we, we're no longer allowed to, to, to drive. And, and the way that it goes with, with um, Toby Walsh's thing is to say, well, what's going to happen is that um, as as self-driving cars um, become more and more present, um, we are going to use them more. I mean, I could imagine especially something like an Uber, because in a way, you don't really interact with the driver very much in an Uber. Well, you can, you can't, you don't have to. Uh, it's almost like you don't really have to have the driver. So I can imagine that very soon that Uber cars will be all self uh, self drive uh, self driving cars um but the but so, so the idea is that gradually we'll become more and more um using self driving cars and as a result we will start losing our skills as drivers um and then uh, according to walsh's argument basically then it becomes more expensive to 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 drive your self driving car um and uh, eventually the, the the insurance premiums will go up and and we will just stop driving. But the important point I think that, that Walsh makes, which I think is a really fascinating kind of comment, uh, despite the lameness of these predictions, what he says is basically, and we won't notice or care. Now that's an interesting kind of comment, we won't notice or care. Um, I mean, one of the things I think about our contemporary culture um, is that in some ways, this is a comment that's, that's, that's been made um, by a guy called Andreas Hoysen um, in his book, Twilight Memories, is that we live in a culture of amnesia. We almost forget the past, we continually forget the past. And I, I, you know, I would invite you all to think, well, what, what was it like um, when we didn't have cell phones and we didn't have wireless internet and so on? I mean, it's almost impossible to even conceive of, of that sort of time. It, it, it just seems so foreign, you know, it's not really part of our world today. So I think one of the interesting kind of comments is the fact that we, these things are incremental and we won't notice or care, they creep up on us in a sense. I mean, this whole thing about the self-driving car, um, the, the comment many people have made, it's not as though it's a sudden revolution. You suddenly have the, the self-driving car. No, what's clearly happened with Tesla is you get these software updates gradually, 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 until you reach a point that happened, I think in October, when we kind of reach this moment when the self-driving car is a reality. Um, so, um, you know, in many ways, I think that even though it's a kind of an aside in a sense, is a really interesting sort of comment to, to be made about uh, about Gary Kurzweil's sort of commentaries in some ways. The idea that somehow um, these things are going to be very incremental. 
The other comment I want to make is basically that um, when we talk about AI versus um, humans, um, as we have over the last few weeks, is in a way, um, it's in certain specific domains, such as Go or chess or those kind of logical operations that AI is clearly much better at certain things. It's, it's good at sort of simple ra rational operations and not so good at others. So in other words, I think it's very difficult um, to necessarily pinpoint any particular moment in time when something's going to happen like AGI. I mean, how do you define it in sense? Because there's so many different sort of things happening all at once, uh, uh, different sort of rates of, of operation. It's almost impossible to do that. <clears throat> but the singularity of, uh, um, is, is near is one of the comments that Ray Kurzweil makes um, uh, it been predicting the singularity. So, I mean, just to kind of give an overview of, of, uh, of and I never put any dates on this because they're so controversial, but the, the kind of stages that have been commented on by various commentators about AI, um, there are different sort of levels uh, of, of match of, 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 of AI achievements. The first one being when AI matches human intelligence. Um, and in a way, we're kind of partially there already, right? I mean, in certain areas it does, in certain areas it doesn't. Um, then the next point is at the moment called the singularity, which is um, the, ter the, the term is described by Kurzweil as being a bit like an explosion of knowledge. You know, once you get this kind of exponential increase um, in intelligence, then it, it leads to other intelligence and so on, and we get this explosion of knowledge. Um, and then <clears throat> shortly after that, we have this sort of moment of AGI when AI gains um, consciousness and so on. And then there's this other, um, these other terms have been used, superintelligence by Nick Bostrom, who's a bit skeptical in some ways about the, the, the always warns us against the, the what's going to happen with superintelligence. And then uh, so similar to that is a term called ultra intelligence, which is coined back in the 60s by Good. And what was interesting about that is the idea that somehow that um, at the, a certain moment machines will um, uh, be able to kind of in, invent other machines. And, uh, and that's the final the final invention that we will ever make is, 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 is that, because after that we will be left behind. But one of the comments I wanted to make is about this is, is and certainly when I've been surveying the literature, um, what I've discovered is that there is complete confusion about what these terms are. I mean, um, so it, it, some, some of the uh, authorities even have been kind of uh, um, collapsing the singularity into AI meets human intelligence, almost like they're the same thing. And other people have kind of um, have, have made the mistake of, of of, of calling the singularity the same as AGI. They're not the same, but nonetheless, there is this kind of confusion. And then if you look at some of the um, some of the public, some of the, the predictions about when we're going to reach these periods, there's absolutely no um, uh, consensus. There is a huge range. I mean, especially with AGI, um, uh, Rodney Brooks doesn't think it's going to happen until 2099, if it happens at all, whereas um, uh, Kurzweil is far more optimistic about it. But I guess my point would be this is, is looking back on the kind of self-driving car model, that's the point. Is is can you even have any moment in time where there is a kind of you could demarcate this when it, there are so many different kind of parameters that need to be considered? Uh, and this tendency to want to predict these things um uh in advance is is clearly a kind of a, a problematic enterprise. And will we even notice it? Will we even notice when the singularity happens? I and mean, if it does happen, you know, and it's so I, I think this kind of you can take this comment about Walsh and, and apply it to all these things and and, um, and and will we be able to notice these things? It, it will happen and we won't even notice or care. Um, and then suddenly game over. This is the comment that was kind of put about uh, uh, the ultra intelligence. What's the point when AI starts developing other AIs, then that's when human beings potentially um, uh, <clears throat> the game will be over. So I just want to kind of finish on a kind of a, a, a few sort of thoughts about um, and then we'll have a discussion about what, what we're going to call AI in the future. And it, it might, might seem a strange thing to say, but in some ways, I think it is kind of interesting to sort of think about and reflect upon the various sort of models that we've had in the past and how our definitions of terms have, have changed. Um, uh, and um, because of the kind of, let's say, the, the threshold of, of use of certain sort of terms, suddenly we, we change the the terminology that we use. So this is an example of, um, although one of the first cars, and the term that was used, I think, is a beautiful term, horseless carriage, because everything was a horse was a horse and carriage up till then. That was called a carriage. Then we get to a certain sort of point when um, 
a, a carriage without a horse is, is, um, is invented, you call it the horseless carriage. But once you meet the threshold point where there are more horseless carriages than carriages, you start calling them cars, and then you start calling carriages horse-drawn carriages. And the similar thing we can talk, you think about in architectural culture in terms of, um, uh, of drawings. Uh, in the early days of, uh, of CAD, um, there were CAD offices and there were other offices where they didn't use CAD. Um, and a drawing in those days, you would say a computer drawing. Um, and a drawing was a, was a human drawn drawing. Um, and then after a certain sort of point, you reach the kind of threshold whereby there are more people working on a computer and a drawing is simply a computer drawing and you actually have to specify a hand drawing. Um, so you meet these kind of different sort of um, thresholds when, when you start changing the kind of terminology um, in, in, in how you're operating. Um, and I guess this would probably be the same um, in terms of the way that we use self-driving cars in that um, for the moment we call them self-driving cars and we call um, cars, you know, cars. Um, but with time, eventually a car will be a self-driving car and we will probably have to specify a human driven car. It'll probably be some kind of romantic thing, just as you're taken to a wedding these days in a horse drawn carriage, you might be driven to a, to, to, um, uh, a, a wedding in, in, a, in a, a human driven car. So the whole sort of kind of terminology um, uh, begins to shift and change um, as, as, as usage changes. Um, and so the question that I would sort of put up there is, is how do we, how will you refer to artificial intelligence in the future? And we've already kind of commented that maybe um, human level intelligence is not the absolute level or the, or the limit of intelligence. We're getting forms of intelligence that we can't even conceive of because they are like the slack moves in Go. They are um, beyond our comprehension. But nonetheless, there is a kind of form of, um, of, of, of intelligence that's appearing out there. <clears throat> um, so just to briefly sort of mention uh, uh, about the question about AGI, um, a lot of people have kind of investing in this idea about, about um, when will, when will um, AI get consciousness? I mean, there are a number of kind of comments that have been made about this in some in way that, um, that maybe we don't, I mean, the idea is that somehow that, 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 that once you get enough computational power, you will reach consciousness. I, I'm not so sure that initially you need to align consciousness with computational intelligence. Um, and certainly that's the view that Dennis Habis has, Sabis has, um, and likewise Anil Seth, that maybe there are two different things. They're two different <clears throat> orders of things. Um, and what I would also say, these guys are interesting in themselves in the sense that they have, um, Dennis Sabis, I think did a PhD in, in, in neuroscience and became an AI expert. Anil Seth was the opposite. He did a PhD in AI and became a neuroscience expert. And in some ways, what you could begin to sort of see is that actually, the question about consciousness is not so important. Um, uh, Max Tegmark goes on to say, well, actually, eventually, that's the only thing we can cling on to is maybe consciousness, and we should redefine ourselves instead of homo sapiens as homo sentience because we'll be outclassed by, by computers. And then Elon Musk makes a comment that maybe maybe we're already, already superhuman because we have these extensions of our, 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 our capacities, um, capabilities. But the question then becomes, you know, once AI is kind of um, so prevalent, will we still call it AI? Um, and it's kind of like the, the, the comment Toby Walsh, makes, Toby Walsh makes is maybe the term artificial is, is, is doesn't help at all. And, and what was interesting, I think, was the initial term going back to, the, to this conference back in Dartmouth in, in 56, I think it was, when John McCarthy coined the term uh, um, artificial intelligence. He wasn't happy with it. He wasn't happy with it um, uh, because, you know, it, it, he had to call it something, so he called it that, but, you know, it necess wasn't necessarily intelligent. Maybe what, uh, artificial, maybe what we're talking about is not artificial intelligence, but simply intelligence itself. Um, Jeffrey Hinton is another person who um, uh, is, uh, um, ha has a background. He, he did a, a PhD in, in, in neuroscience and then became a very famous um, uh, um, AI expert now based in, in Toronto. And he just simply says, I want to know how the brain worked. Um, and likewise, uh, Demis Asabis, who is behind DeepMind in London, um, uh, he, make, he doesn't use the term artificial. He doesn't use the term artificial intelligence. Our ambition at DeepMind is to build intelligent systems. Um, uh, so my, my speculation is that maybe in the future, we won't be talking about artificial intelligence, but just simply intelligence. Um, uh, 
and this in fact was the kind of one of the conclusions I came to um, in, in my book was that the quest for AI is the quest for intelligence itself. People are not talking about artificial thing, anything. It's about intelligence. And that's why you get neuroscientists and, um, and AI experts um, uh, kind of essentially look at the same kind of question. So my, my point would be that we, we talk now about architectural intelligence um, as though that is a kind of special domain. And eventually when everything becomes intelligent, you'll just call it architecture. When everything becomes um, an AI itself is a term that I suspect will, um, will disappear. So I just wanted to kind of throw that out there as a kind of a thought that um, what will happen in the future, will we ever have these kind of moments of the singularity? Will we be able to even conceive these things um, uh, um, or are they, as, as uh, Rodney Brooks say, kind of empty speculations that, that happen in academia, but are kind of meaningless in themselves? Um, yeah, yeah, comments? I mean, is the, is, the term, is the term artificial useful in AI? That'd be the kind of question. Maybe can I uh, share yeah. my thoughts on that? Yeah, so uh, sorry about my camera. Uh, um, I, I, I think it's, uh, it's, it's really true that uh, nowadays we don't really need to remember, memorize any phone numbers because we have smartphones. Um, I think uh, it is really true that uh, it, these kinds of tech, technologies will be just given. Uh, people will uh, lose the ability of driving cars, uh, lose the ability of a lot of many things that are uh, referred as dirty jobs. Uh, and I think uh, it is really important that we kind of uh, define or, or start to realize what should be our role as human and um, kind of really understand the distinction of different types of tasks that only human can do or human does better and what machines or these kind of intelligence can do better. These will become uh, tools that will be very helpful for our lives, but they won't, I don't think they will replace our humans. And I feel like a lot of these discussions about AI is really kind of eliminating the, uh, the humanness uh, of like anything behind it. For example, the AlphaGo uh, on the scene, uh, of course, we only see the big screen of AlphaGo, but behind the scene, there is a huge team of people and huge sets of machines are analyzing and calculating and, and making uh, a lot of different decisions behind the scene. And I think it's, it, it was a teamwork of human and machine. And there was, team of humans were deciding which algorithm to uh, go for, uh, which algorithm to play, or where to place the computers, and how many server powers they are going to use, and so on and so forth. Um, and I think there are so many things that are still needed by done by human. And I think it's really important that we realize and understand that there has to be a collaboration between human minds and these tools and i i'm also really interested in discussing about those aspects in architectural field uh, and i mean uh, that's why uh, one of the things i have been working on with the augmented reality is one of that kind of sense that um, uh, that we are dealing with a lot of like really highly manual work but that is uh, very much uh, done uh, with the use of human kind of intelligence or, or kind of uh, uh, intuition that can adapt for adapt to different kind of uh, mistakes or errors in real time. But also there are so many things that are coming from a computer uh, that, that humans cannot really uh, do by kind of manual sketches or, 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 or just like um, kind of traditional ways of uh, imagining the geometry. So I think there are lots of ways to kind of deal with the uh, kind of 
a teamwork or collaboration between these two kind of really distinct uh, intelligence. And I'm really curious uh, how uh, other people also think about this uh, human roles in the future um, that is playing here. Uh, maybe go ahead, Matthias. Just, just uh, sorry, I didn't want to interrupt you, but just to your point about the question whether to call it artificial intelligence at all. Uh, I think who was that? Um, somebody did a Theodore. I think Theodore Theodoros made this comment before about uh, AI, um, like the the um, the, 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 the sorry, um, AI is basically an umbrella term. Right, and so it's actually describing like a whole set of different techniques that are getting proliferated at the moment, which is based on a variety of different neural networks. And I'm pretty sure we have not discovered all the possible things we can do in this kind of area. So there's still room to grow. The, the term is useful, I think, in terms of differentiating very simply between organic intelligence and artificial intelligence. So it's an arti so we, if, if we as humans possess organic intelligence in a variety of different ways, then we can differentiate that to something that is synthetically created or achieved by just calling it what it is, artificial intelligence. Yeah? The bigger question is if it is intelligence at all. That's the point I think that really is an interesting discussion point because there's like a dozen different definitions about what intelligence actually is. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So there's like very simple ones which come from uh, medicine, there's others that come from anthropology, there's others that come from computer science, neuroscience, and so on. So there's like different ways to describe intelligence. And I don't think we are really at the point to specifically define what all these neural networks entail. They're basically imitating, and we discussed this the last time, they're imitating processes of the human mind that we think we understand in a basic level. We don't understand it completely, but we have a, like a specific understanding of that. And as soon as we have better understanding of that, also the neural networks, the artificial neural networks will increase in their capabilities because we just understand the process of thinking better. But to the point of how to use artificial intelligence, I mean, there's like two areas that are really interesting to discuss. You remember Mark Burry, he pointed out that, art, that artificial intelligence might, might be nothing else than an extension of the mind of the architect, right? It's like a tool. Like every tool, it's an extension of our body in some way or the other. Yeah, Artificial intelligence as being an, a more sophisticated tool that we can use to achieve specific goals. One you is trying to achieve automation in specific processes of architecture. I'm trying to interrogate it in terms of its artistic and ethical values and so on. So there's different ways to skin a cat. But in a larger extent, the whole conversation is actually part of the conversation on automation in the world. Uh, where we are going to have like, you know, there's like a lot of things we have to discuss along the line, specifically economy, ethics, um, ecology, and so on. So which are really larger aspects here of how we're going to live our lives and how architecture will cater to that life in the future. That's very important. Yeah, like How are we going to be a part of an automated world without work, where economical systems are going to emerge that are different to what we're seeing now? We are already talking about the uh, post-capitalist uh, post era era, right? Uh, Mark Fisher has wonderful uh, writings about that idea that, you know, how are we living in a, in a world that is uh, where we are inundated by technology, where work is different than what was thought of in the capitalist era of the 19th century. We're basically working economically on a system that is 100 years behind our technological abilities, which is kind of bizarre, to, be the, to say the least. But we're holding on it because it produces money in some way or the other. Yeah. Uh, sorry to go for this really large picture, but uh, I think that's important to, to understand that what we're discussing here has larger repercussions. Yeah, no, just so we pick up on that, I think Alexa makes a, a really valid point. All the terminology we're using, I mean, learning, I mean, do we mean the same when we're talking about AI and we're talking about human learning? I think the term intelligence is on, we, we, we bandy around the same term, but actually they become different in their different sort of contexts. I mean, just to pick up on, on um, Samin's point, I mean, I, that's something we haven't, I was meaning to really address in the first session and get around to doing it, but I mean, I think it's important to kind of, to, 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 I, to my mind, the comments that were made by, by David Chalmers and Andy Clark in the Extended Mind essay back in the 1990s, where it was, there's a kind of genealogy you can see 
to that concept. But the idea that somehow the cell phone is kind of becomes part of us because that's where we put our, uh, we don't, don't memorize numbers anymore. They're all memorized on that. I think you can sort of construct a kind of genealogy um, between that, that then, you get, then, then there are other people who kind of uh, who pick up on the notion of, the, cy of the, the cyborg and so on and so on and so on. And eventually we get to the point where we're now at, which is basically extended intelligence, whereby we're using the AI as a kind of prosthetic extension of the self. But one of the comments that was made about that in some ways was that um, rather than, obviously, rather than seeing it as competition, it's kind of a question of how you can supplement the human with these technologies. But one of the comments was made is that maybe it allows us to become even more human because it cuts out all of these kind of things that we're not very good at, frankly, which is the kind of mechanical processes and things, and allows us to invest more time in that, which I think is a very kind of valid point in itself. Uh, but one of the comments I want to make is, is that, you know, I mean, this thing, going back to this kind of question about the incept, imperceptible change, how things do change, and maybe you don't even notice it or even care. I mean, I've always made this kind of comment that, that, that we've, we even in my, since I was a student, things have, have died out. You know, the travel agent is not really, you will book online. Uh, the idea of kind of uh, camera shops have pretty much died out because you have cell phones and and the idea of kind of getting your films processed, that, no, no, there's no film process, well, maybe there are processing places anymore. Things happen and gradually and perceptibly they change and maybe we're not even aware of it. Um, and, and I was just wondering, the, I mean, we, I think this is something we're gonna look at later in the final session really about what the impact of this is all on architecture. But if you were to take the model of the self-driving car and push it to its extremity, you know, if you don't need a driver anymore because there's a car that will take you somewhere. Um, and once you reach the point um, where, and I'm sure it's gonna happen, where AI will be able to, to or whatever we call these systems, um, will be able to, to generate buildings, will we ever need an architect? Um, anyway, I don't wanna go, that, that's probably gonna be a discussion that was gonna, gonna, gonna take place in the future, but I think um, all these are kind of valid considerations. Um, anyway, let me open it up to, to other, other comments. Uh, I yeah, remember. Uh, sorry. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, I just uh, uh, remember there's a one metaphor made by Fifi Li. She once said, uh, uh, "Nowadays AI is like you have a like uh, a million of uh, three-year children, and they can do a lot of things for you. So you know each of the AI cannot do a lot of things, but uh, like uh, there's a lot of uh, three years of kids." They can repeatedly do a lot of things, and they have some uh, level of intelligence already, or uh, the uh, smartness. Yeah, so it's a very interesting way to do this. Uh, uh, to to think about uh, what is the artificial of uh, uh, intelligence. I think this is a very interesting metaphor, and uh, in one of the uh, uh, scientific. Uh, scientific uh, 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 sci-fi, let's say sci-fi novel by a Chinese writer, Ci Xing Liu, uh, The Dark Forest. And he also made an AI uh, kind of imitation in his uh, book that uh, uh, like also million of uh, people, one people just doing one thing as uh, uh, showing the black or white flag and there's a, a large matrix of people on the plaza and they just do this, uh, do white or black. And th this entire thing is the, the original uh, machine of AI. So this is something very interesting. Yeah, get from the, the some, something I just, uh, yeah, get in mind, but the interesting metaphor. I mean, so it was three year old, three year old kid. Is that what you meant with Fei Fei Li? Yeah, a million population of a, a of the three year kids. Yeah, I, I, maybe I can. Uh, uh, I believe this this thought is, is is beautiful in in a lot of ways. Um, I mean, I hope you can let me be part of the conversation. I'm totally an outsider in a way, but um, but I'm still a curious person. And my background is in history of architecture in a way, so maybe I can jump in in some things that were mentioned today. But um, of course, I, I believe that with your comment, uh, I, I cannot stop thinking that we need like a 
a new kind of uh, sensibility, or at least we are experimenting a new kind of sensibility. But there is a lot of resistance because we have a history. And uh, there is um, a, a, an important thing in this because in a way they are the, the idea of the artificial, it's related with our history of our preconceptions about things. And this is in part why I, uh, why I reject not, not only me, a lot of uh, theoreticians, philosophers that I read that they reject the idea of the, uh, this uh, binaries concept, because in a way what we are teaching, if we are teaching to the computer is to think like us. And that could be a problem because in a way I'm afraid that this can over coding the structure and make it even infinite, like monotonous tracing of stage that we are repeating and repeating continuously. And that's the problem. And this, this question that Neil, this uh, is super controversial about the, the kind of continuity between uh, the history and the future and this discussion or the past and the future and this discussion between history and creativity, it's super controversial in a lot of ways. Because, uh, I mean, I, 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 I'm afraid that in this phrase that you say, we, uh, we continue forgetting the past. Uh, no, the problem is that we continue forget questioning the past. We are not questioning our past. And uh, th maybe the problem is that we cannot escape from this past, from all this preconception that we have. And this is the problem with um, prediction as well that we believe that we can pre-trace in a way the destiny. And, <laughs> and that can be uh, a little bit, uh, I mean, uh, it's my concern that this can be uh, in a way, this put us as the center of everything again. And this could be a, a, a problem because in that way we are like going to a, a kind of, a, Yes, pre-trace future or this idea that we uh, can change everything, but it's it's not it's not. In, I mean, we, we shouldn't go in that way. I I, I believe that uh, it's the same with the idea of control and the architect. The architect should control the future, should control the, this idea of projection. So in a way, you you know what is next. And if we know what is next, why are we going to leave it? You know, no? what about experience and what about sensibility? That's, that's could be my, that could be my question. Could, could I just, well, you just triggered off something, I, something I meant to say, which I, I, my apologies for not mentioning this. Last, last week, Philippe Morel came up with this incredible sort of comment. <clears throat> and I, 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 it only hit me afterwards. So my apologies, Philippe, but it was, uh, and he was talking about Le Corbusier and about how okay. we, how we, how we, and this is really, really, uh, really interesting, how we need consciousness to even have architecture. In other words, you can have take a, gro a drone flying around with a LIDAR and you can record <clears throat> the three dimensional, you could describe an interior of a building, but without consciousness, we absolutely are not aware of the qualities that are appreciating it. So uh, my apologies, Philippe, I think that was the most profound statement and I, I, I we didn't pick it up, and but it was, you know, and that's why I think consciousness is so important. We wouldn't even have architecture if we didn't have consciousness. Um, absolutely, totally profound. Um, Maybe to Marina's uh, point. Um, <laughs> thanks a lot. Actually, this is this is absolutely true. So that that is a great comment, Philippe, and now in also Neil, um, uh, Marina, about your point in terms of. Uh, let me talk a little bit about the role of history. And I'm particularly just being completely egoistic here with my work on that. So it's my point of view. It doesn't mean that it's everyone's point of view. And I've been also criticized for that. But I actually made the example or the point, basically, that architects work like data miners. When you are getting educated in architecture school, you have a, you know, a discriminator, which is your teacher, your professor, that is teaching you, for example, different architecture styles in history. So he's going to teach you what is Gothic, what is Baroque, what is Romanesque, and so on. Yeah. And how is he doing that? In a lecture, he's showing you images. Yeah. So he shows you images of Baroque architecture, of Gothic architecture. And then after a while, you as a student are going to be able to differentiate between those styles because the one discriminator, let's say Neil, showed you images of, you know, 
Renaissance architecture or something like that, okay? Later on in our careers as architects, we used that ability to construct in our mind architecture that we envision based on things we learned in school or, in, or throughout your life as an architect for that matter, yeah? So um, the interesting part is that there's only that many pictures that we as architects can ingest in our lifetime, but the neural network can do millions more than we can, yeah? So basically using a similar technique, you're actually able to teach. And here we are again with teaching and learning uh, a neural network, what is Baroque, what is Gothic and so on. And we've done that. So we actually created databases of Gothic architecture of Baroque architecture, not because we want to replicate it. And that's the point where it becomes interesting, but because we can use that as a basis for architecture that is different. If you start, for example, to inform, inform a neural network or ask a neural network, do me um, a mutant between Baroque and modern, because we also do a modern database, you're gonna get things that don't look modern and they don't look Gothic either. It's something different. And that's where it becomes interesting for me as an architect with a conscious and with a mind and with perception is that I can say, wait a minute, that image is really interesting. Let me try to pick that out and see if I can really do a completely fleshed out architecture project out of that. So it's not even about the neural network doing the whole, the entire architecture. At the moment, I think it's sometimes something that inspires and pushes architecture, or me at least as a designer, it pushes me in a direction that I would not normally do because I haven't thought about it. Yeah, But that definitely is like, hey, wait a second, that's interesting. I'm gonna pick that up and really flesh it out as a design. Yeah. So I'm not even relying completely on a, on a, it's not a completely bottom up thing, but it's not a top down thing either. It's somewhere in between. Let, let me uh, to, to react to Neil's uh, uh, comment. Uh, let, me, let me recall uh, an anecdote. You know, I really understood that I was uh, interested in, in art or in architecture. Um, I think it was in uh, uh, 1993 or something like that. Uh, I have to check. There was an exhibition on minimal art at the Guggenheim Museum in New York. And uh, I didn't know much about art. Uh, yeah, I mean, I used to visit some museums and, and things like that with with my mother when I when I was uh, a kid. But she was not so so much interested in uh, let's say uh, contemporary art or modern art, or more more in art uh, in general. Let's say and mostly Renaissance and, and classic classical uh, art. And so I visited this uh, uh, exhibition, and then I saw the, uh, this uh, uh, work by, um, uh, sorry, Robert Morris. I sent you the link in the discussion panel. Uh, the The name of the of the work is uh, the sound. The sorry, the box with a box with the sound of its own making. So it's it's an amazing. It's an amazing work. You you just see a standard uh, wood box, wooden box, but inside uh, there were a tape recorder, and uh, the tape recorder diffused the sound of the making of this box. So you hear the sound of the workshop, the guy cutting the wood, uh, uh, putting the nails, and all of that. I mean, in in fact, it was Robert Morris himself, you know, nailing nailing the box. And this work of art is just absolutely amazing. It's it's something that had an, an, an effect of me, on me, that probably nothing else uh, uh, had uh, at that time. And maybe even as today, I believe it's one of the most powerful piece of art I have uh, ever ever experienced. And I use this word experience um, on purpose because if if I would have seen an image of this wood box, wooden box, uh, I would have missed, let's say, maybe 95% of the real nature of this uh, artwork, you know? And what I see at the moment, and uh, again, I'm a huge defender of artificial intelligence, and I, I wrote uh, uh, quite, I, I think it was in maybe in 2009 or 10, or I don't know, that uh, if we, I mean, 
a well a well programmed uh, application on a smartphone can produce an architecture which which wouldn't be as good as the one of Le Corbusier, but maybe ninety percent as good as Le Corbusier, and uh, which means that ninety percent as good as Le Corbusier is thousands of times better than most architecture which is built at the at the very moment. So I believe that in a sense artificial intelligence can replace thousands if not hundreds of thousands of architects or developers building uh yeah shit let's let's say the let's let's tell the truth so um i again i really believe that uh, ai is going to to improve the situation of architecture but we have to keep in mind that who is going to give the small parameters to this AI at some point. And the small parameters to this AI, according to me, again, it's like being able in front of a piece of art, like, uh, uh, let's say, from Duchamp or this artwork from Robert Morris, to identify that it's a very interesting and smart and major piece of art. We still have people nowadays who, who, who go in museum and who say when they watch to when they watch Duchamp, you know, they say, "Ah, oh, it's not art." And I think the the ultimately the debate is not going to be about forms. It's not going to be about if artificial intelligence is great to is is able to create such or such a form if if it's able to to create something which looks like Gothic or modern architecture or whatever. Ultimately, the real artificial intelligence that would serve us as architect is an artificial intelligence who would be capable of identifying um, the first, uh, the Urinoir by Marcel Duchamp as a major piece of art in 20th century uh, history. You know, because it, if probably the, an AI would, would identify this as a, as a toilet, if you train AI on Marcel Duchamp, then it will classify the work of Marcel Duchamp as part of the toilet, you know, toilet apparatus, uh, furniture. So you see what I mean? Uh, this is why I really believe that ultimately the, I mean, the ultimate challenge for intelligence is conceptual intelligence. And it seems to me that there will be no other challenges on this one. Is uh, conceptual intelligence associated with consciousness? When it comes to understanding of piece of art, probably yes. And it's probably associated with a very deep notion of experience uh, but again you know it's very difficult to describe what happens when you are in front of a really great uh, piece of art but for sure an ai at the moment wouldn't identify Duchamp as something else and toilet furniture i have to say something to that philippe because i only partially agree with what you were saying because the uh, the Gothic and, and modern example is important because it actually shows that neural networks, and I'm talking about neural networks, not AI in general, yeah, can only work on things we know about. It cannot, you know, it, what, what data would, it, data is things we have on our hands that can be used in order to achieve a specific goal through a neural network, right? The, the, the whole problem with neural networks is that it's actually glorified curve fitting. So you have a curve that is defining your goal and you're trying to get to this goal as, sort of, as close as possible. So a curve fitting of one yeah, would give you a modern building that looks like modern. And I'm talking specifically about looks here. Yeah? But the interesting part is when you stray away from that, when you don't get close to that one, because that, that's where things happen which are unexpected and different and unusual and maybe new. Yeah. But that, uh, that actually introduces new knowledge. And that's the important part about it, new knowledge. Yeah? 
things that are not yet in our books, they're not, not yet defined specifically. And I think that that gray area of non-super specific results in, in neural network is where the really interesting things happen. Where we can, that's the areas, these gray areas is where we can discuss, is there something like creativity going on there? What is creativity? How do we understand it? And by just posing those questions, it challenges us as humans to respond to this new knowledge. Yeah, but yeah. there is also there, there is also something true that uh, not because it's in a book is true. I mean, not because a book defines something as gothic means that it's gothic. I mean, what is gothic and what is not? These kind of levels are not totally true because if you start to study more, I, I, I mean, I, I'm. For example, for Wait my second, thesis, please, please. You, you have to no, 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 I just no, no, want no. to, I want to finish, if you'll let me. Wrong. Sorry, but you just said truth. I didn't say truth. I said knowledge. It's two different you, things. No, no, no. You, you said truth. You said that uh, you, you teach to the computer things that, uh, that we know they are we true. Know. Yes. That we no, know that we, we know. are true. Yeah, okay. No, we know. That's my question. That's Different my question. Points. Because they are like kind of um, idea of... Uh, uh, that uh, a book is something that you cannot criticize in a way or that uh, these kind of labels, we cannot criticize these labels. And the truth is that we cannot in a way say that something is absolutely gothic or that something is absolutely modern. And you are talking about visual things that I can also doubt about this visual thing that you are, that you are um, pointing like something that, okay. Wait, wait, wait. I, I would like I, to I know would, would what you define as modern yeah. architecture and no, no. what you define as Gothic architecture. That's to, okay. To... That's okay. Just two things. First of all, I didn't talk about truth and I didn't talk about books. I don't know where you took that from. Yeah. So just to be clear about that. Secondly, uh, there is, of course, a bias. Er uh, the bias is an important part in this whole thing. Without bias, you cannot actually run any sort of database today. But uh, for example, you can automatically search. And here comes the fun part. You can automatically search for images online that are labeled Gothic. Have fun doing that. It's really very entertaining because the things you get out when you're looking for goth or Gothic online has nothing to do with architecture. Yeah, it's kind of entertaining. So then comes the, the labeling process, the, 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 the bias that is done through that. So if I go through 2000 images and I, I, I put away 1,200 because it's goth pinups and stuff like that. I will start to look into what I, my, my own knowledge tells me is gothic architecture or not. And we can differentiate here between, you know, gothic of the 14th century, gothic of the 15th century, neo-gothic architecture. We know there's differences, yeah? But at the end, you will end up with a database that is specifically labeled, yeah? Whether this is labeling done by me alone or by 50 art historians that actually helped me label that, that uh, database makes a huge difference. And there I agree with you. Yeah, there is bias and there is of course the necessity to understand that labeling a database is nothing that should be done by a person alone, specifically when it's about more general things like understanding what is Gothic architecture. But consider the possibilities of this. Like for example, let's assume you do a database of like all the Gothic cathedrals in Europe, yeah? And you can train it to specifically recognize features in that database that allows you to recognize unknown pieces of Gothic architecture and say, this was designed by the same person because now through the comparison, I understand that. That's insightful for the humanities, for example, in architecture history. You should be somebody who understands that the best. This is good, uh, Matthias. This is a this is a good application of of, of course. Uh, I, but I would say uh, still it's an application which conceptually is not that challenging. It's mostly like the machine has some better capabilities than us in identifying patterns, uh, and we make use of that. It's exactly it's exactly similar to using dogs. Uh, to do a person uh, to search for people when there is an earthquake or things like that, you see, because because the dogs are much better than us in identifying certain kind of patterns and more precisely when it comes to dog, it's a, um, it's a, a sorry sensory uh, uh, a smell sorry smell patterns, but but a smell is nothing else that, than a certain kind of chemical patterns. 
ultimately. All that can be transferred into, in, into the concept of patterns. So I, I agree uh, it could help, but again, I think that conceptually speaking, it's not a big, it's not a, a, a very difficult question. Uh, a very difficult question would be the following, again, comparing with dogs. What happened in the mind of the dog when the dog uh, smell, smells you, for example, you know, smells uh, its master? Uh, or what happened in the mind of the dog where when he sees such or such uh, uh, scene or such or such, you know, in, in fact, um, I would say as long as we consider AI in terms of pure pattern matching, I'm not saying it's not efficient. On the contrary, I think it's far better than any of of us uh, will ever do, will ever achieve, and, and it's getting better and better and better uh, because it can have billions or, or trillions of parameters. It can be trained on trillions of data as well, etc. But I believe that this, uh, this doesn't even scratch the question of what is conceptual intelligence. Uh, in, in, let's say, I mean, it's, it's, it's very Wittgensteinian at some point, this kind of question. But uh, what does it mean, again, to identify or to be in front of a piece of art of, of Marcel Duchamp or a piece of conceptual art from the 60s? Uh, in fact, the AI, just, just imagine that you train an AI on a huge data set of conceptual art from the 60s. The AI will deduce conceptual art based on images of conceptual art. But then how do you encode the concept? Because the real meaning of conceptual art, of, of course, it's the concepts that are used in producing conceptual art. So how do you train that sort of AI, you know? I mean, if you train AI on conceptual art based on images, then it's like, it's, it's a complete nonsense. It would be like, like visual art or let's say optical art, but that's not what conceptual art is about. A conceptual art is not optical art. I, you see I what agree. I mean? So yeah. there's, a very, there's a very difficult question here. I believe, but I practically mean, I, speaking, yeah. there's no question that AI is gonna take over the world. Uh, and I would say its power is absolutely unlimited. The only limit I can see, and I'm not even sure if it's a real limit, but the only limit I can see at the moment is pure conceptual intelligence. Just a quick, the short comment only. I, I mean, I agree with Philippe about the 2D problem that we have in architecture, that, you know, it's basically a lot of the things we're using in AI and architecture are 2D based. Uh, but this is going to change within this year, I can tell you, because people are starting to train 3D, 3D databases for architecture. And then that, again, is a different story and a different conversation. Maybe I could I could invite others who haven't said anything yet if they want to. I mean, I know there's a lot of comments going on in the chat here. Um, I don't know whether Alessio wants to would like to add anything or uh, Anna or let me just uh, throw it out there as a kind of comment. Yeah, wait. Hi. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, Alessio. Hi, Nir. Yeah. Um, I mean, there there are um, there was a wonderful round of uh, comments and concepts passed along. And I, I wanted to actually uh, go back to something that um, was said before about not uh, getting the AI in the place of taking decisions, but just uh, generating, because that's actually something that I'm, in, uh, I'm actually interested into, which is to train a sensibility that takes decision and uh, with, uh, with the position that I'm aware that it cannot encompass uh, uh, or 
it, it's not trying to reread the entire history of architecture, but just uh, narrowing down to something that I'm interested into, which is considering the entire process of design, a process of uh, uh, a network of decision, a pattern of decisions distributed, uh, um, diffused between uh, different subjects and intelligences that can be either biological or synthetic alike. Uh, and it's more of a cooperation. So um, training, uh, and of course, I'm into that. I'm interested into reinforcement learning mainly, uh, because then it trains something to take a certain kind of decision with all the limitation that uh, we're just uh, right now brilliant, brilliantly uh, exposed by Philippe in its argument uh, in his argument with um, conceptual art uh, versus the kind of uh, um, the, the kind of stimuli stimuli that uh, uh, an apparatus can have uh, the kind of sensibility that an apparatus can have and and also another consideration uh, that is uh, that I'm uh, I'm convinced of uh, what Philippe said that uh, in the end uh, you have something that can generate uh, um, an average quality. Let's say that it's a lot higher than the one that we are using uh, right now, but that will also elevate the standards to what we consider as average. That's what I call the Instagram filter effect. So um, it's something that it's uh, also AI based <laughs> somehow. It created a, a tool accessible to everyone. Uh, the quality of the images produced are compared to the, I'm, I'm still comparing it to the production of the average of five years ago in terms of photography. So it completely redefined uh, what we uh, judge and value as average in terms of photography. And that I think will also happen this kind of adjustment because our our consideration of values, of environment, everything we we consider and elaborate is contextual and relative to, to a certain extent. So our understanding of standards, our understanding of uh, what's the minimum, uh, you know, uh, coming from Maslow pyramids of needs, when you, when you satisfy a need that becomes uh, something that you take for granted, and then you grow new needs, uh, new needs become desires and so on and so forth. Uh, or desire become the needs. So, um, yeah, that was uh, a couple of things that I wanted to to put on the table. Can I just um, uh, pick up on something there? We had this we had this discussion about whether artificial intelligence is the right term. You use the, the, the term synthetic, and I'm just wondering whether synthetic intelligence would have been a better term. We wouldn't talk about synthetic biology as artificial biology. It, maybe it's a a different sort of term. Yeah, that, that was also something. Uh, yeah, that I remember because it, so much went on, and uh, some notes that I was mentally taking just uh, went to the back of my mind. And yeah, to, to that distinction, I think it's uh, it's a distinction that it's going to be uh, fundamentally uh, create a lot of discussion uh, when it comes to the creation of. Uh, uh, synthetic organism uh, about when you when you get to close to the to the threshold between uh, uh, synthetic or uh, um, biologically grown uh, you realize that i remember all the experiments from uh, uh, rachel armstrong with the protocells i remember all these kind of experiments from coming from the swedish biologist i don't i don't recall the, the name exactly but uh, a lot of things that, or the um, now the, the biologist who did create and printed the synthetic DNA, now uh, it escapes the, the name. I don't recall the name right now. But uh, if, for example, you are able to create uh, an entity, and I think that pretty soon it's going to, we're going to be able to do just that. Um, or I'm thinking about the experiments by Alexander Daisy Ginsburg, for instance. Um, to create a, a biological entity, which means made out of the four uh, uh, proteins, ACTG or ACTGU, as they use in the new, in the new um, vaccine that the Pfizer is using. So they mimic basically the, the genetic structure with a substitute that goes with those uh, uh, proteins. So you create a fully biologically uh, intended for all the, the scopes uh, 
creature, but you're able to program it from from head to toe, uh, metaphorically speaking. Is that artificial uh, or is that not artificial? But I think we need to, at some stage, um, begin to, to wrap up. This has been a fantastic discussion. I really want to um, compliment uh, a, a lot of very interesting thoughts coming out. Actually, one of the things we, we know that we'll get around to sort of um, uh, raising, following up with some of these kind of questions later on. I haven't had a chance to respond to Marina's comment about the, the history question. But one of the things that struck me today, actually, in terms of um, what's happening, and we're talking about publications and the kind of time lag that exists in sense in terms of publications. So, uh, uh, what I'm discovering is, is, that, is that I have to submit everything tomorrow for my book, and yet new knowledge is appearing. You know, I'm getting feedback that actually my book would be much better if I could incorporate feedback over the next few weeks. It just, it's just it's, um, it's been updated in some way. Um, and, and that's to say that I think actually what's been really useful today is to sense we've got, got a group of individuals, I mean, many of them very highly significant in the field, and there's me kind of provoking with my naive kind of comments, but I think it's been an interesting conversation in itself. But I think my point would be this, is that, is that in a sense, there's a kind of frontier of knowledge that's moving on, that's moving on. Um, and uh, we've got a glimpse today of some really interesting debates. So uh, this has been an incredibly informative thing, and, and my book is already out of date, right? So, but maybe this is the arena in which we find ourselves um, fairly soon in the sense that kind of, well, maybe already, um, that be, because publications are out of date, that we have to have these kind of platforms and arenas um, and, and find somewhere we can bring people together. But um, I just want to say this has been, this has been terrific. I, I personally have got a lot out of this. Um, uh, we, there are some things we're going to be, no, inevitably we're going to talk about uh, in the future. I think that especially the, some of the comments that Wan Yu's been uh, making about our own practice ex cool, ex practice ex cool will come in when we talk about the office itself. Um, uh, and, and certainly the theme of, of creativity is something that's, that I think has been central and um, that's going to be more central next week when we look at the, the question about AI and creativity. But um, I just want to take the opportunity to thank, thank everyone for contributing today. Um, we're going to put this online and it seems to be almost like this is a kind of becoming a new kind of tradition in terms of, of knowledge, you know, of, of updating things which probably next week will be out of, out of date. But um, any final comments from, from, from any of you before we, we wrap things up? Well, thanks a lot. It was great. Thanks. Well, thank, thank you, Philippe. And, uh, you yeah, know, I mean, thanks. It's thank been, you very much. It's, thank it's, you. It's been, we look forward to seeing what, uh, what Matthias and others are doing in their books and things. Um, and uh, thank you. So, um, Gwen, you any final comment? No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> No, thank you. Okay, it's great. All right, so yeah. so um, just to say that, that we're going to put this up, up uh, upload this onto the, the platform. Uh, also uploaded was this incredible four-hour marathon yesterday that we had um, with uh, with Daniel, which was incredible. Um, uh, style gans and and, uh, um, and and cycle gans. And the comment I made yesterday was it, it was that actually one of the comments we don't know we we we, we maybe people are unaware of that Alan Turing himself was a marathon runner. He came fifth in the British Championships in the, in the marathon. And I think that's probably, uh, you know, you have to invest in these things. So thank you for this marathon session um, and uh, look forward to, to, to next week. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.